So this is a conference to mark the 80th anniversary of the City of Durham Trust. And it happily coincides with the 50th anniversary of UNESCO's World Heritage Convention. And we've developed the program for this morning in close partnership with the World Heritage Site Coordinating Committee, of which I'm privileged to be a member. And you'll see as we go through the program, the close relationship between the Trust and the World Heritage Site. <clears throat> I wanted to pay tribute to Jane Gibson for her contribution to setting up this conference, but she's not reached here yet. She's still tidying up in Owen Gate, mm -hmm. where we had the refreshment. So I'll say something about Jane later when she is here to embarrass her. Um, the first speaker is Michael Herlow. And Michael embodies this partnership between the Trust and the World Heritage Site. He's, he's a regular assistant to Jane on a voluntary basis with the work that she does as the World Heritage Site coordinator. And Michael is also one of our trustees. So without further ado, I'll invite Michael to speak to you and he's going to set the scene for the rest of this morning's event. Thank you. Right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's something of a portentous title, I think, this one, the Trust Vision for the Way Forward. So there is something of that in there, but it's a bit discursive on route. So apologies if you don't get the vision quite. Um, the, I propose to offer a view of the Trust, how it is related its activities and concerns to the World Heritage Site and how that relates to the future role of the Trust. I hope that adequately portrays the trust and highlights the work of its trustees. I'm a resident newcomer and I really don't want to overstep the mark with all the worthies that have gone before me. I think the, the trust is allowed a glance back before looking forward. The conference marks the 80th anniversary for founding of the trust as the City of Durham Preservation Society in 1942. And I think that dates really quite significant, you know, more time. <laughs> Uh, there's no uh, notable longevity. Many civic trusts only started in the 60s and 70s. Uh, there's something to be celebrated, and there is a long list of Durham citizens and those concerned for Durham who should be congratulated for their involvement with it. And uh, just to pick up one of them. Uh, and this is sadly Roger died last year. Uh, but as you can see from the length of his service to the trust, it, it was a very valued person, very helpful, knew Durham very, very well, worked at the, the cathedral. Uh, and is very typical of the sort of person in the past and now that actually has contributed to the work of the trust. <clears throat> the, the trust strength lies in its membership, that, that's hopefully you. Uh, people living in Durham mostly who care passionately for the city's heritage and future. It is a community organization. Now, I think that's something worth stressing and is sometimes lost. The trustees step forward from the membership or are drawn into how. Uh, they're a highly experienced and professional group most are drawn from backgrounds in local government and academic institutions, and more often the university, or involved professionally and in the cultural life of the city. All share a passion for the city and offer a depth of understanding of it, and I think their value is more often drawn to public attention. I think it's something to be celebrated. The general interest of the Trust is the city, its heritage and changes to it. Just as the buildings of the World Heritage Site are the townscape focus, for the city, this is also the same for the trust. This extends from the core, this, this place we're in, we are on the peninsula and palace green, uh, to, to how the city and its buildings relate to, back to the World Heritage Site and out to, into the setting. There are examples of the involvement from the past, and this one is something that comes up quite often, and make no apologies for it. Uh, keep a power station. In 1944, the fledgling trust only been going two years, was involved in opposing the construction of an extremely large coal-fired power station at Keeper, and I think people are probably very familiar with the scale of it, which illustrated at the time. <clears throat> this would have been very damaging to the setting of the city and the World Heritage Site, and obviously it was uh, worked around the setting of the cathedral, but it's the city as well that would have suffered. The Trust was in good company at that time. The cathedral, the university, and the planner Thomas Sharp also opposed it. And I draw attention at this point to John Pendlebury's recent excellent talk on Thomas Sharp 
at the Trust's AGM that touched on it. In Sharp's words, the proposal was environmentally disastrous. Following a public inquiry and sub subsequent discussions, it was abandoned. And if you look at Keep It Now, they have that magnificent view looking across society, spoiled a little perhaps by the, the parlance with the training for the, uh, the uh, electricity board as it now is, but and the view up to, to Keep It Itself. And uh, I think this is a rule setting. <laughs> But that's another point. <clears throat> uh, another uh, one is the is Brown's Boathouse. Uh, the trust supported the retention of boat, about Brown's Boathouse on the riverside in the view uh, to the World Heritage Site. And they fought for a long time to, to keep the building. As the trust noted, it's 2004 annual report uh, describing its rebuilding. Trustees feel that their long campaign to save the boathouse has been rewarded. Uh, and obviously it's, it's perhaps a little struggle finding its way in the current leisure environment in Durham, but there it is. Uh, less visible behind the scenes, but very important uh, and formative in, the relation, in relation to the future was the major trust response and involvement in the County Durham plan process. And I think it would consider itself to have, have really helped to push that, it thinks, in the right direction. And it's not always about opposition or preservation. Uh, each year, the trust offers architectural awards, and it really tries very much to find positives and good design in Durham, and, and really works very hard for it. And this year, uh, the, the winner was the uh, uh, the cathedral uh, and its doors. Uh, and it's always been alert to the trust has always been alert to new developments in Durham and have a positive impact. And it celebrates those. Uh, this is the new uh, cathedral north and south entrance lobby, and you're probably all pretty familiar with that, but they are an exemplary contemporary intervention into a very sensitive historic building. And I think the opening up through view into from the entrance of the north door into the cloister is, is remarkable and very, very good. Right, moving on to, to change. <laughs> In the trust's 80 years, much has changed and continues to do so. What was still a county town at its core, and this is me looking back on it, you, you might differently view, uh, remained despite the extensive changes during the 1960s and 70s from the road and major riverside developments. And I'll leave those who have lived through those changes to think about that character now. There was a steady erosion of the support functions of the county centre, you know, as it was the solicitors and everybody else that went on the banks. These have started to erode over the years. Uh, it's been accompanied by shifts in local employment that accelerated in the past five to ten years. The reliance on publicly funded institutions and the growth of the university created a different economic reality for the city. As Durham's retail streets suffer in the same way as many others in the country, they are also evolving to service a very different function as a major leisure focus. This is in the midst of large-scale student presence. Uh, I picked up a picture of, of Saddle Street, although in truth, there's a steady creep of leisure uses there. It still has a retail component, or there's a bit gift shop element around it, the edges of it. It's perhaps Saddle Street that you could, uh, no, sorry, um, Silver Street, you could see that more clearly in with its vacancies, difficulty in keeping retail. And that's what I'm, I'm striving to, to point out here. There are points to be made from my rather imperfect sketch of the evolving city. <laughs> this is a five minute view of how Durham has evolved. It's, it's not so good. Uh, Changing use brings pressure on existing buildings and for new development. I'm stating the obvious, but th this brings change. Changing functions create very different pressures on the infrastructure. That's the buildings, the roads, everything else. It, it has to, to cope with the changing environment and the pressures on it. The reduction in independent businesses brings with it a greater reliance on larger institutions, businesses and chains. This generates pressure for uniformity in how uses are presented to customers. They like to present the same image in Basingstoke as they do in Durham. And how buildings are adapted to accommodate it. What goes missing is the personal investment accompanied by a focus on only those parts that serve the core business. Corporate identity is often at odds with local distinctiveness. And this is my night shot of the Revolution Bar with both its, its canopy topping there, which looks more permanent than the temporary, and the, the rather two lit sign. As a personal point, I wish to emphasize that it is by animation, by people, <coughs> and the traditions, customs, and practices 
uh, it is an important and increasingly recognized part of character, distinctiveness, and heritage. Sorry, a very long sentence, that one. Um, what, what I'm saying there is that people make places. It's not just the place itself, it's the, the tradition of use and the type of use that people place on it that makes the city. And change impacts on that. These cumulatively all impact on the city and its function as a setting for the World Heritage Site. The World Heritage Site is also impacted by those wider economic currents that, well, we know what those are. In turn, these are the realities that the trust must find its way through. So it struggles just like everybody else to find its meaning and relevance in, that, in the context of that change, of which there's a lot. <laughs> Uh, over the past 80 years, councils, and this is looking at the administration side of things, uh, over the past 80 years, councils and the administrative boundaries have ebbed and flowed, and I think you know just as well as, as I do, just how much change there's been in all that. Each has brought different attitudes and focus on down as a city, but the trust remains. It perhaps offers a more constant presence in these changing times, and I, I think from my view, looking into the trust for a moment, stepping to one side, I think it actually really matters it's a, a constant presence and has maintained a very similar sort of focus through the years, adapting to change, but actually trying to find the core of relevance for itself. <clears throat> in its current manif manifestation, the County Council offers a strategic planning and day-to-day -day management of planning functions. A very welcome addition to the, this, this scenario is the Parish Council and the evolution of the neighbourhood plan. Uh, and I would stress very much that I think this is a really positive intervention in the city. Mm -hmm. These offer further policy protection for the World Heritage Science setting, and Grenville Holland and Sue Child are going to talk about that later. Again, the Trust must continue to find its way through those administrative changes and establish ways to respond to them and the people involved with it. Uh, looking nationally for the, the Local Authority World Heritage Forum, and that was the gathering of all the local authorities that actually had a World Heritage Site, and it's very much local authority dominated, as the title says, has evolved now into World Heritage UK. And that organisation represents the wide range and different nature of World Heritage Sites as they've evolved and, and their, how their management differs. It helps support Durham World Heritage Site through the coordinator and it is a good, strong, unifying force across the country and, and a big support for Jane, who's the coordinator. <clears throat> it also offers insights from the other World Heritage Sites. Chris Blamford is a very active president of WHUK and is actively concerned with the national and international context. He's also very knowledgeable about and supportive of Durham. He actually, his company actually produced the first management plan. <clears throat> uh, also notable is the growing link between World Heritage UK and ICOMOS. Sorry, I'm banding around with the, the <laughs> titles here. ICOMOS is the body that advises UNESCO on World Heritage sites and is very important to us in Durham. Uh, it also has a national presence in the UK. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the uh, it, WHUK is very much forging uh, alliances with ICOMOS, and I think that's a very important development and can be very supportive. And I very much look forward to Chris's Zoom contribution later. <clears throat> the Trust is a community interest organisation and relies on its volunteers for activities and its support and the support of its membership. You. <laughs> It is an independent organisation, and that's the point of my stress, and does not express political bias in its work. It offers responses on developments in Durham, strategic and policy initiatives, and strives to support positive action. As a relative new trustee, I'm very impressed by the depth and extent of its work, and I really am not going by it. It is to be stressed that this is voluntary and very substantial amounts of time are invested by the trustees, and it really is, is very notable how much they give it to us. Right, the future. <laughs> the trust has its own challenges in maintaining a group of committed trustees. It also needs to keep and preferably grow its membership with an emphasis on broadening the range of people joining the organisation. Always a struggle in a, in a city like Durham. In looking at the ways in which other civic trusts and preservation societies operate, there are precedents in how they engage with the planning and development process. The trust independence and body of expertise provide a strong platform for greater recognition in the same way as other organisations. Other civic trusts are actually given 
a, a greater, uh, more sort of formal role within the planning process and consultation, and it's quite notable. I suggest that the community input and the strength that this represents, the, that's the trust, should be regarded as a key asset. And the following panel with Warrior, Lucy, and the WHS young ambassador, whose name I don't know, apologize, um, uh, we'll talk about perhaps about that Turkey involvement later. There's perhaps also something of an understatement suggests we live in interesting times. Um, I, I tried to check out the source of that quote. It turns out that the earliest mention is actually probably the Yorkshire Post. It's not a Chinese curse. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a Yorkshire <laughs> intervention. <laughs> Uh, there is also volatility at such a scale that global changes will affect Durham, its administration and institutions. And I think that goes without saying we, we really are in a period of change now. The change had already been gathering pace in the past few years, and I think we should expect more. It's hoped that through this toil model, the very sensitive and positive involvement of the Cathedral University in caring for the buildings of the World Heritage Society has continued. And I think that's something at least stressing. We, we have remarked as trustees on the uh, positive way in which the, the key buildings on the World Heritage Site are actually being cared for, and it probably doesn't get shouted about enough. There's a big investment of time, money, and interest in that. Right, now to scare you. Um, <laughs> this is not what I'm proposing for the future of Durham. Uh, this is Eindhoven, and you'll see the relevance of this in just a moment. As we prepare to face the future, it is worth looking at how other places that have faced great challenges in regenerating their infrastructure have dealt with them. The Academy of Urbanism, yet another organization, is a grouping of different specialists in urban development. And it has often dealt with that in seminars and, and presentations. It, it does a, an international grab, mostly from Europe, kind of from Ireland, uh, about how regeneration is working and how it you know, develops and uh, what forces actually guide it. And the, this is a good example. One good example, rather different to Durham, uh, they do note that, is Eindhoven. Uh, as it sought to recover from Philips, their major employer, it employed something like 20,000 people direct and many more in the city, bigger city than Durham, but it's a major hit to it. It's really going to almost not wipe out the city. Uh, and as they, they pulled out, uh, the forces around the city actually regrouped. The city administration and community, businesses and university collaborated to seek common goals. Now, you may like or dislike this, but this actually does show the range of their interventions for the very major, quite significant showy piece, right down into housing and to small sort of shopping areas. And they also went into infrastructure. And the change that they have managed to, to bring about in Eindhoven is remarkable, given the situation that they were in. Uh, and I think that that sort of collaboration is what I'm trying to drive. That's the key point. It's about partnership and the relevance of people working together. Uh, this another example was all moved forward through partnership and common aims growing up based on growing mutual trust. And it's perhaps idealistic, but it's a clear indicator of the power of partnership. It can tackle a city in, in this kind of situation. You know, the great forces, you know, come together and you can do great things. Greater alignment of all the active forces affecting the World Heritage Site in Durham would benefit it and the city and could offer stability in the face of change. It's a growing aim of the trust to seek partnership and support initiatives. It worked closely with the parish council and previously quite a number of its trustees were involved in the formation of the neighbor plan. Now it's also going to be quite interesting today to hear Mike Collins from the, the Historic England, Craig Wilson, Visit County Durham, see their role in relationship to the World Heritage Site. What next? As we look forward to the Trust 90th anniversary and then its centenary, we believe the Trust is well placed to help and support the World Heritage Site in its setting. <clears throat> Collaboration, greater partnership, involvement, and recognition could be aims for the Trust. And I'll show you this without apology. This is all the assets that are currently not part of the World Heritage Site, uh, and they're covered by the new expansion. And that's a key example of where I think that the trust can help with its community base uh, and its trusteeship it is in supporting is the World Heritage Site expansion. <laughs> Another is also the Red Hills Miners Hall and it's been two years ago to become a World Heritage Site in an international combination with other workers' halls. Having two World Heritage Sites would be a very significant achievement for Durham and Ross Forbes, I believe it is, uh, that's here to speaking about that later. 
So that's the end of my section. Uh, and I'd like to thank very much to those who have supported the City of Durham Trust over the years and worked so hard to support the World Asia site and the city. I think we owe them a lot. And uh, thank you all for turning up. <laughs> thank you. So easy, Michael. There is a question session. The format for this morning, I should have said earlier, is about 15 minutes presentation and about five minutes questions afterwards, so, because we have a, a whole variety of perspectives to present. So, any questions for Michael on that interesting mm -hmm. talk? <laughs> Somebody must. Have. <laughs> I'll stick my head on the bulk of Arabic. Thanks. Apologies, Michael. I missed the beginning of your presentation, so no you may have um, picked up on this. But something that uh, in the World Heritage Community we're having to deal with is this balancing of interests and sustainability. Uh, we are a 21st century living, working city with a beautiful World Heritage gem at its heart that is full of 21st century people living, working, visiting, um, worshipping, all the wonderful things. And we're already seeing this conversation with UNESCO, uh, World Heritage Centre, building up. Uh, Liverpool, perhaps the most extreme example of those sort of balancing of interests. Have you had any thoughts about how we should take that conversation forward? Because I don't think it's going to go away um, with developments, modern life in these lovely living places. Even my colleagues in the Lake District, which you think is sort of unchanging, um, are sympathetic and can see the same challenges. I wonder what thoughts you've got of how we start, how we continue that conversation in a constructive well. way. I think I sort of hinted at, at quite a lot of that in what I was saying that, you know, we live in change and that's exactly the sort of change that I think will affect us. Um, it's the wider economic situation, it's the administrative situation, it's uh, how the university fares in terms of its, its <coughs> student numbers, the accommodation for students, all these things have a great bearing. And I think what I'd like to stress, and I hope the, the trust has stood for before, is there are some greater constants that lie below that, the need to be looked at and recognised. Oh, senior relationship. <laughs> the senior relationship uh, to the World Heritage Site. You, you need to sort of maintain that. And I think that at times, the economic pressures tend to take the attention away from, from something in, in the World Heritage Site here that can help form the brand image for Durham, if I dare call it that. Um, it is what people, you know, will people come to Durham to, to look at the new developments down on the riverside? Well, probably not. They're, they're going to come here because of the, the World Heritage Site. That's how it's known. That's how it's known internationally. So if you want to maintain an international presence and just ask Elon Musk about this today, um, just how that's going, um, you need to be very careful about what you destroy in the image that you present to others. And this is very much about the bricks and mortar. So it's not about change. You need that change to actually fuel the preservation, as it were, the active conservation of the World Heritage Site, but you can make adaptions to use that respect that core value. And that's really what I'd like to suggest is, is the way forward, perhaps. One thing I haven't mentioned, and you did, uh, was sustainability. And I think that that has come to the, come to the fore just as the intangible lesson, um, her assets that people are and traditions are Sustainability is really much the name of the game, I think, from here on in. And I'm sure the trust can be equally well placed to understand and work on that. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yes, that's it. Could you just uh, give us a little more detail on the partnerships that you mentioned? Um, perhaps uh, uh, you've talked about better partnerships. Um, with, with 
Well, I, th I think that the, the, there's, there's been quite a trade between the, the parish councillors and the trustees and the same person quite often. And the <coughs> trustee members were actually very active in forming the neighbourhood plan. And we do work closely with the parish clerk and the councillors. Obviously, we need to respect the, the political bias that we're not supposed to express. And it's the support around issues uh, and developments and so on. So we have actually worked very closely with, with the parish um, uh, and you know, don't always come up with exactly the same view, but broadly speaking, I think our interests are, are similar. So there's been, been quite a lot of strength in that, and I, I hope that we can actually provide some support uh, on the kind of technical side sometimes to, to uh, uh, Adam Shanley, the parish clerk, who's a particularly open and uh, you know, keen person who, who's keen to develop those sorts of interests. So that, that is what I would like to stress, yes. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Michael. Thank you. And I'm particularly pleased to see this emphasis on partnership. It was the theme I chose to emphasize when I first became chair of the trust. And I think it's, it is absolutely <coughs> essential. We can do far more when we work with others than we can on our own. And a very recent example this week of partnership with the parish council, we'll be hearing from Councillor Holland shortly, of the possibility that there would be a public inquiry into the proposed housing developments at Sniperley Park. The Parish Council, the Trust and CPRE all work together very closely in preparing for that inquiry. Pleased to be able to say it's not going to happen because the developers have pulled out. But that's not to say they've pulled out of the whole development, but they've pulled out of the inquiry process. But it was a really good example of how the three organisations worked really closely together. And together, we had more to offer than we had on our own. As it happens, the next presentation involves a partnership <laughs> of three people who are going to tell us <coughs> what the, the World Heritage Site means to them as people who live in Doe, two local residents Wally Akani and Lucy Zabluska, and also the World Heritage Young Ambassador, Sebastian Sanford Hopper, who probably doesn't live here all the time, <laughs> but I'm sure he's very happy here when he is here. So can I invite you to come up and make your presentations, please? Do you want to use the, the, the mic? <laughs> I think that might be the best. We haven't actually rehearsed the choreography. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a radio mic here, which uh, may help. Um, I can't remember the time now. <clears throat> Shall they just come to use the... No, I'll... I'll uh, there they are. Oh, you it's not... It's not Do you want me to start, Matthew? Uh, yes, you haven't, have you not got slides? Yes. No. Okay, yes, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm Lucy Shabaska. I've lived in Durham for 28 years. I'm a freelance researcher and I've been involved with the trust for 20 years in different ways. So I offer to talk on community perspectives. But I just want to say that there's not one community in Durham, there are many communities. And the boundaries of Durham are very fluid, so it depends on which bits of the city you include. And also, I haven't had the time and the resources to talk to a statistically representative sample of people. However, in order to try and get a feel for community perspectives, I have talked to a range of people I know, people I've just gone up to, and asked, what do you think about Durham's World Heritage Site? 
And um, I wrote the responses in my new book, and uh, here are five points besides of five issues that I've pulled out. So generally, the World Heritage Society is a good thing. It's the cathedral, it's enriching. And I learned about it and some Cuthbert in school geography lessons. <laughs> some people say they're not sure exactly what, where it is. I talked to two Thai master, master students on Observatory Hill who said they'd seen that there was a World Heritage Site on Google Maps. They didn't realize that the cathedral was a World Heritage Site. They loved the cathedral and they climbed up Observatory Hill after seeing a photo of the view of the cathedral on a friend's Instagram page. Other people said they're not sure what the World Heritage Site does. It, some people think it provides funding, some don't, but some think it helps draw in funding. Some people say it doesn't provide funding and it doesn't have enough influence to, um, to prevent poor planning decisions in parts of the city outside the boundaries. A few people said we don't really need a World Heritage Site as the cathedral has always been there and will always be there. Secondly, people's perspectives are shaped very much by their personal history. So an archaeologist and historian, they said they love the medieval city and the Norman architecture. An engineer said that he marveled every time he went to the cathedral thinking how on earth they managed to build this 900 years ago. And a man who said he's a very strong Christian said, for me, it's really important that the cathedral is a symbol of Christianity. So you get a really wide range of perspectives. And it also evokes strong emotions. So a few people said, well, it's just there. I just take it for granted. I just ignore it. <laughs> but others <clears throat> said they felt uplifted every time they saw the cathedral and they were out and out in the city. They loved the views. They were privileged to live somewhere so visually valuable. And um, one person said they loved being part of a choral tradition in the cathedral even if they have no religious faith, just being part of that community that's always been around the cathedral is very important to them. <clears throat> I think um, trying to understand how involved different communities in Durham are with the World Heritage Sites, given that the community engagement is one of the pillars of the World Heritage Convention, I think it, it, that it needs more you know, research than I could possibly do. And I think that um, there's a huge amount of voluntary community and civil society activity linked to the cathedral in some way, for instance, choirs, heritage organisations like the Trust. But uh, it's not clear if the World Heritage Site plays any role in, as that happens anyway. And there also, some people said, you know, is the cathedral more of a place, is the World Heritage Site cathedral more of a place for the wealthier, and more scholarly sectors of society? So there's lots of issues to tease out there. Lastly, Three quick points. Um, various people said they think the World Heritage Site needs more publicity and signposting. I think very few people know that there's a World Heritage Site plaque on Palace Green. Um, people said, well, where's the new World Heritage Site Centre? They didn't realise it was the Palace Green Library. Um, I think that when some people come to the marketplace, the first thing they do is they ask, where's the cathedral? Because they can't see it. <laughs> um, secondly, Various people said the World Heritage Site needs, um, that Palace Green needs more protection. Uh, resentment about the number of days the white marquee is up on Palace Green and the number of days the university, the cathedral's closed because the university is using it for various activities. And lastly, <clears throat> I think, uh, and this is something I feel very strongly about, areas outside the World Heritage Site core need to be valued more. And it would be wonderful if the World Heritage Site could work in partnership with everybody else to raise the status of um, the skyline, wonderful skyline views from Observatory Hill and other viewpoints around the city, which David Miller, who's here, has done through his Seven Hills of Durham Walk. So lastly, um, several people said that they just fell in love with Durham while passing on the train. And so the view from the railway line is, is also really important to people. But that's a very quick run through some of the perspectives uh, just by I uh, do again just by doing mock spots. <laughs> So I'm Wally Akani. I came to Durham as a PhD student in 1975. <laughs> and uh, the view from the train was the thing for me. That was it. I was captured, fell in love with it. It hadn't been because I'd never been anywhere beautiful before. I'd traveled 
pretty much to everywhere that is now a World Heritage Site and wasn't then, across North Africa and the Middle East. Um, but Durham sort of got me. And uh, one of the interesting moments of that day was that the professor of psychology, then Fred Smith, insisted on driving me back to the station so he could show me another view, which was a view from Marjorie Lane, just to make sure I did accept the place that was going to be offered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up in, in three parts of London and I studied at Manchester, studied at Oxford. And so I was going smaller, smaller, smaller. And I think one of the things about Durham for me is the smallness of it is <laughs> ideal for um, things like friendships, um, raising children, hosting grandchildren now, but um, you can go around all everyone you want to see and everything you want to see and do in Durham in, in a small time. Um, after my PhD years, I went to live on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem in the year that it became a World Heritage Site. Um, and again, I had this amazing view down to the Dome of the Rock, um, but the politics weren't very good. So coming, coming back to Durham and the joy that you get just every time you sort of see it, walk past it, um, is what's kept me here since, since then. Plus the things that happen in there, organ recitals, um, choral music, the brass bands after the Miners Gala, and, and those are kind of goosebump events for me. Um, I'm forgetting about my slides. <laughs> so, uh, yes. I think um, Durham was the first, one of the first UK World Heritage Sites, and I grew up in, in East London, where my father's idea of what to do on a Sunday was walk to the Tower of London, which didn't get to be a World Heritage Site till quite a few years later. Um, and I think one of the reasons is about the views because you don't see the Tower of London until you get there, but you see Durham Cathedral particularly, we always forget to mention the castle, um, from lots of different places. And for me, the views are the main reason that Durham is so special to stay in. So every morning I open my curtains and I look to see what the cathedral's looking like. Some mornings it's got the sun on it and it's some mornings like today, it's gray against gray. Um, and the trouble with mobile phones is you just spend your whole life taking photographs. Did you say it this one years ago? Yes. Yes, and then so some nights you can uh, get the wonderful sunsets behind it. So it's 47 years and still taking pictures. It's, I haven't got all 47 years worth on here, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, the World Heritage Site is the core of the city, but it's important that it's ringed by the amazing um, riverbank paths. And, and so now that I'm retired, th those are actually more of a focus of what I do. So from everywhere I go, I walk on a riverbank route um, and especially during COVID, when we were only allowed to do walking and not much else, um, there are so many different ways to go around this city using the banks around it. And I think there is, there is talk about including the actual banks in the expansion, which, uh, which was mentioned before, and I think that's going to be actually crucial. Um, I'm just going to do some skipping through, otherwise we're not going to get done in five minutes. So yes, the, the routes that you, are the different ways that I come upon the cathedral. This is one of my wow moments because every day the sky is different and every day you see that coming up Bow Lane, if you don't recognize where that's coming from, um, is, is one of my stunning places. And then if I get, whoops, can't find my, there we are. If you uh, go down to Bath's Bridge and go the other way, you've got this wonderful view, which makes it look like a ship. <laughs> Um, and then from St Oswald's, you only get to see this view in the winter because in the summer that's completely blotted out by, by leaves. Um, I thought uh, you probably all were at Martin Roberts' talk about this issue of trees and how the trees were planted with avenues so that you'd have views. And I'm a great supporter of the idea that we should, we should go back to that and have, uh, have our views back from different uh, orientations of the cathedral. Um, I know that the kind of current fashion is plant trees and not chop trees down, but I do have to confess that in my back lane, I've got a friend to chop down a sycamore tree so I could have my bedroom view. Um, by now it would have definitely gone. Um, so yes, I think uh, most of my contemporaries who, who are people who came to Durham for whatever reasons in the 70s and 80s and could afford, afford to buy a house, which I don't think you could do at that age now, um, have stayed because they love it for the same reasons, that it's an amazing place to have access to the World Heritage Site, but to everything that's around it, to have it in the backdrop of everything that you do. 
Um, and, and I think the students as well, I, I'm, I hope Sebastian's going to back me up on this, also arrive and go mostly, mostly, I'm not saying everybody, um, and then even if they don't think of it as a wow, they do like it's a backdrop for their graduation photos. Um, so where are we? Graduation photos. <laughs> So, and then the other thing I think is, is important, and I don't know if anyone here represents the education community, but most days, or at least, at least once a week, a coach load of people will be dropped off in New Elbert and tossed across Kingsgate Bridge to be brought into the cathedral. And it's really important that that generation is being made proud of their heritage for however far afield they come. Um, so I think the next 50 years of the World Heritage Site status is in the hands, as, as has been mentioned, of our parish and county councillors and their planning committees and, and, and the members of the trust. And I feel that since I retired and became involved in all of this kind of stuff is there are lots of people who do love this city and want to pass it on to the next generation. And I'm fairly sure we won't make the same mistake as the Liverpool planners. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm not checking if I've got any retweets on my <laughs> posts. I promise you, it's just this damn generation with their phones. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the City of Durham Trust for inviting me to talk, as well as Jane uh, for notifying me for this opportunity, and Wally and Lucy for um, inviting me to a meeting for this to discuss some of the ideas. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm a master's student. Uh, um, my name is Sebastian Sankofa. I do International Cultural Heritage Management with Robin Cunningham. And um, I've been here for about four years now. So I did my undergraduate in archaeology as well. And I'm currently uh, a young ambassador of World Heritage Site um, at Durham. Um, if you were to really consider my student insight to Durham, there's really three main events that you see Durham. Uh, cathedral and the World Heritage Site. One is on the train up here, or maybe the, uh, the car journey up here. <coughs> Two would be the matriculation, which is kind of the formal invitation to Durham and letting the students be invited into this community, and the third time of graduation. Now, for some of you, that may be a very unfortunate moment because there's <laughs> three times that the students only see Durham Cathedral and think, I really like this place. Um, but in any other case, it's really important that Durham Cathedral and Lord Heritage Site in general is then used for change in the future. And how can we promote this further? Um, talking from my personal experience of how I was introduced to the cathedral and the hot site instead itself, I found it to be a very comfortable space. I come from a place where it has a cathedral, so Durham is not too dissimilar to that place for me. And coming to the cathedral was a place where I could have some quiet reflection, especially in times of stress, anxiety, many student problems that come and arise from university um, life in general. And besides this, Durham World Heritage Site is a beautiful work of architecture. There are many students that like to view from afar, as Wally and Lucy have been saying, it's a very Instagrammable post <laughs> to make. <laughs> Um, and many students like to take pictures from the observatory, from old Durham Gardens even. Um, the site of it is really astounding, it's really beautiful, as you saw some photos. So for me, the promotion of the sites and the walks around Durham may help student population in general with a sort of emphasis on the physical health and well-being of students. There is a lot of topic and um, conversation around mental health and well-being for students. And for me personally, I understand that from a very personal perspective. And I find that when I go around Durham and see the Durham World Heritage Site, I'm comforted and feel very at home here once I am able to appreciate it for its main properties. And so, the walks around the area of Durham, we can consider how it's intangibly connected to Durham World Heritage Site, and the walking, walking activities obviously can promote physical health. A development goal that many companies actually starting to want to achieve as a sustainable development goal. Um, of course, where we go with it is up to, I'm sure, the City of Durham Trust and the World Heritage Site um, um, communicators. Um, 
Furthermore, the work of the World Heritage um, Site Young Ambassadors for, World, um, for Durham World Heritage includes the um, UNESCO Challenge for Promoting Peace. So this is in response to the Ukrainian war that's been going currently and um, how we can promote the sites to emphasize world well, peace um, through um, either exhibitions or some of the activities. And obviously we have World Heritage Student Ambassadors World Heritage Day happening in April the 9th and 8th. It's a really great opportunity for students to get involved. Um, so from a, from a point of view from me, I would like to see that students are able to recognize Durham for its beauty, but also for its quiet reflective practice and generally how personal it's become my second home from home. Um, and I think a lot of students feel that way as well. Thank you. Are you going without taking questions as well? No, no. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much for those very interesting personal insights. Are there any questions for our panel? Adrian. Um, what do you feel about engaging more young people and not only students, but also young people in the uh, residential community? Um, <laughs> um, um, personally, I think that where we are heading with technology and with the use of social media in general, I think social media is going to play a massive part. Um, I think a lot of young people feel giddy when they see the simple QR code pop up at any place. Um, so maybe the use of um, some sort of techno digital technology um, and digital heritage could really emphasize the World Heritage sites to get involved with. There is also small activities like thinking of um, current day problems, as I say, with the UNESCO um, want for um, world peace. I think that you can really engage young people um, with current politics and they, if they're able to express their views through the World Heritage site, I think it'd be a really great chance for them to get involved. Um, so if you have any more comments. I think other than students, the trouble with um, the actual environment of the city is that most young people can't afford to live here. Yes, yes. Yes, certainly seeing uh, young people on Observatory Hill, I think photo sharing through Instagram that is absolutely huge. So yes, I really agree with you on that basis. Yeah. The Trust does have a very splendid website, which Sue Childs looks after. Is, is that the sort of thing that would help? I would say that coming from my own personal perspective of where the most engagement comes from, it would come from social media accounts. And so if there was a link to the website after from a social media account, I think that'd be a really great opportunity for people to get more information. Um, obviously, the management of social media accounts is not easy, even for someone of my age. And um, the engagement is very much up to date with every new trend, new activity that's going on. Um, so it would be great to see the website um, uh, close at hand. Um, but how we would get that to a student may be considered for, uh, or sorry, a young person may be considered for social media activity. Yeah, which we, we, we do have an Instagram account. Yeah, yeah. it would yeah. be nice maybe, maybe through you get more students aware that it exists. Yeah. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> the challenge is getting followers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Joe. It's not a question, it's an observation that you've got people zooming in. If people, if you're getting questions from the back of the room, perhaps the people at the front could, could summarise them. Before I, the I was, I hope, reliably informed that the owl would pick up questions from the whole of the room. I don't know. <clears throat> have, have we any way of verifying we, that? We, we, tested, we tested it earlier, and I think. Um, at least two thirds of the way back, this device uh, picks up reasonably well. But um, 
anyone who's on Zoom, if they're not hearing the questions from the back, please let me know by the chat and we will make sure they're repeated for the next session. And anybody asking questions from the back of the room, please speak up. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll move on. Thank you very, very much, Paolo. <laughs> Our next speaker, Craig Wilson, is from Visit County Durham, and I think he will have been heartened by hearing all those wonderful things about how nice it is to live in Durham and to visit, visit Durham. Uh, Craig is the project lead for this uh, very successful Northern Saints Trail, which he's managing to stand in front of there. <laughs> and of course, they, those trails focus on the World Heritage Site as their destination. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say from your perspective, Craig. Thank you. Thank you, John. So thank you, invitation, and congratulations to just on your anniversary. Um, hopefully I can navigate around the slides. Essentially, um, I work for the County Durham, which is the destination management organization for the whole of County Durham. Um, and as part of my remit, uh, as John mentioned, I also uh, as project leader of the Northern Saints Trail as well, but I cover quite a few other things as well, such as investment, the Durham Tourism Management Plan, one or two other projects as well. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the significance of the World Heritage Site to the visitor economy, and that word visitor and economy is going to be central to the presentation that I'm giving. Um, but it's very much about trying to get a feel also for the context of the city and the wider county and how it's developed and evolved on the back of the cornerstone, really, of the World Heritage Site. Uh, and Durham Cathedral uh, and, and the wider uh, area. So, as I mentioned, we are a destination management organisations. We're one of about 50 across the UK. Um, we work, work very closely with Visit England and Visit Britain. In a former life, I was with Visit Britain in Germany, uh, Austria and Switzerland for five years, uh, and also worked in London with Visit Britain, uh, looking after uh, at their headquarters uh, for Japan and Asia. And I've also been um, marketing manager with uh, York Tourism here for seven years as well. So hopefully we can bring a little bit in terms of perspective nationally and internationally. We very much work for the public and the private sector. Uh, I have an office in County Hall. Uh, we also have 450 members who are largely in the private sector. So we try to make sure we try to bring those two worlds together for the benefit of visitors. Our main aim is to grow the visitor economy. Um, and that comes in all shapes and forms. It's about people spending money in hotels and restaurants and attractions, and that obviously equates to employment. Um, and currently we're hovering around about 10,000 jobs, full-time jobs in the county uh, for tourism. Um, coming up to the pandemic, uh, the value of the, the economy was just about to go over the billion pound mark. And then unfortunately, uh, then the pandemic came along. So numbers dropped quite dramatically, obviously in 2020. They're climbing steadily through 2021. We hope to get back to where we were in 2023, but a, a billion pound um, and 10,000 jobs. It's a huge part of people's lives um, and employment in, in the county and in the city. Um, people think with about tourism organizations, um, we produce nice leaflets, don't we? And we mail them out. We do a bit more than that's the way they used to be. We do that as well. We also have websites and social media and the full raft uh, of marketing skills. Uh, but we also um, are kind of the bedrock of market intelligence to understand the visitor, uh, to understand trends. We also get involved with the development of the destination as well. So I have regularly planning applications coming across my get desk, which, I'll, which I will comment on for hotels, for attractions as well. Um, we also are a partnership funded organization as well. We have more than 450 members, partners across the county who appear to be a part of what we do. And obviously for that money, they want their input and they'll want their two pen, which is quite right. Um, so just moving that on, just, um, I'm sure you can't read all of that, but just to give you an idea of the scale, that word partnership came up in the early presentation. We very much have to work in partnership. Um, some of the national partners I mentioned already, um, we also work with things historic cities, with Northeast destinations, uh, the Northeast Tourism Alliance, uh, Rural Growth Network. We have to be in it to influence these, uh, these, these organizations and make sure they understand the very best about uh, what we have to offer as a county. 
our destination partners, as I mentioned, we've got all sorts of people and organizations in there, including, of course, the UNESCO World Heritage Site and various other organizations as well. A real raft of, of partners, and they range from Mrs. Blankensop's Ben Breakfast to a Lift Naft Dune Tea Cafe, right up to Beamish, the World Heritage Site, and everything in between. So we, we have to be very flexible in how we try and give something back to all those partners and make sure they're involved in influencing the Durham Tourism Management Plan, which we do every four years. That's the plan, hopefully, will keep us on the straight and narrow about where we should go as a destination uh, and, and make sure we do all the right things. So how significant uh, is the World Heritage Site to this economy? That enormously, that's what we all need to say, really. Uh, it is actually, uh, obviously, a bedrock and always has been uh, of this economy. Uh, look at the scale of it, look at the beauty of it. Uh, it's obviously central to the city and to the wider county. Um, so it's obviously a, a very big driving force for the visitor economy. Um, it, it, it is something that really catches the eye, literally, from the train. Um, it's the flagship, and uh, it's, that's probably the best way to describe it. I just want now to take you back to also some of those facts and figures. I've given you some facts and figures um, in some information graphics, which you've got in front of you. I'm not going to go into through those in any great detail. I just wanted to give you a feel for the overall value of the county uh, county's tourism performance. There's all the numbers in terms of the spend uh, and, and all the numbers in terms of the jobs. And then the comparison to the city as well. So the city is obviously a very uh, strong component part of the industry, um, but obviously 3.3 million visitors to the city, 15.77 million to the county. Because obviously we've got some really big attractions, uh, which I'll touch on later on in the, in the wider county as well. Um, one of the challenges we have specifically for the city is that um, only one in 10 visitors stay overnight, but they contribute almost 50% of the spend and the jobs that they create. So we need to find a way of getting people to stay here to stay overnight. Um, and that's better for the environment. Um, so if we can have a, a, a larger pr proportion, it's better for the impact on the city as well. If we can get that proportion of overnight visitors up, that's better for everyone in for being involved. Um, the average day spend of visitors, uh, which is that's the 90% of the visitor market, um, is well below the national standard. Um, so people are coming here, um, they're seeing the cathedral and the World Heritage Site, they have an afternoon tea, and then whoosh, they're gone. I call it the hit and run. So we need to try and find ways of keeping people here longer uh, and to make sure they stay longer and spend more. Uh, and that's again better for everyone rather than lots of people coming for a short hit or one or two hours. Let's have them here for a longer day uh, and so they can see uh, everything we have to offer the city. So, we need a critical mass of great attractions in Durham City to maximize what the, the World Heritage Site has achieved, really. And um, so, the, 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 the World Heritage Site has done all the heavy lifting for decades and centuries in terms of tourism. Um, and lots of businesses have benefited on the back of that. Uh, we perhaps now need to find a more rounded offer to might find ways to keep people here a little bit longer with perhaps a few more attractions that can blend in and are very relevant to the history and the heritage of what the city has to offer. More on that later. Again, that's quite a small slide, but I'm just trying to get across some of the motivations that visitors have. Um, as you can see, that the heritage uh, as a motivating factor it is, uh, is uh, has doubled from three to seven percent. The general sightseeing, the World Heritage Site, will very much be in the thick of that as well. So there are lots of different regions, reasons why people come. But one thing to always remember with visitors, they they think in package. They don't think in silo. They don't think I'm just going to the cathedral or I'm just going for a coffee. They will see and experience quite a few things. This is for the whole county, uh, and obviously people will almost take a pick and mix of various things that they want to do and they'll design their own packages. So it's about when we're doing our marketing to make sure we can, we can think about how we, we message how we have what we have as a destination. Um, it's also important to understand the visitor motivations as well. Um, in terms of her attractions, piece of work with England, uh, they've done a lot of work in terms of looking at the emotional impact of heritage attractions, the different experiences we have, they have, and people immersing themselves in those destinations as well. Um, so, the long and short of this slide is that you really need to understand why people come, what their experience is, and gear your offer and your facilities and your experience around why they've come and what they're experiencing. 
And also that we need to gear our marketing as a destination to make sure we pick up on those, and really push all those buttons. Um, just to take it back now to, I, I've been with this get down since it started 2006, the big piece of visioning work there to find out what people beyond the county uh, understood. Uh, and it was a lot of research was you've never been, haven't been for a long time at that time. And what they, um, majority of them did recognize was obviously the World Heritage Technical Cathedral, uh, Beamish, the University, and Durham Penny Crick Club. So those were the four things. Beyond that, they were really struggling to think, well, what else does it offer? It was a bit of a blank canvas. So we obviously had a lot and a lot of work to do to try and broaden that uh, appeal. And um, one or two people thought, uh, can be Durham win Northern Ireland? So we obviously <laughs> had a long way to go. Um, and we've been putting a lot of effort into that. And I'll try and explain some of the things that have been happening. So we've been trying to build on those strong foundations of the World Heritage Site. Um, and lots and lots of money, is, as you know, has gone into Beamish um, and to make it even bigger and better, focusing on the 50s theme now. Uh, the cathedral obviously invests a lot of money in terms of their the, 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 the glass doors and obviously all the money they've put into um, their experience development over the last uh, 10 years has been enormous. And um, so they haven't stood best in their laurels, and that's brilliant for visitors. Um, but we also have um, some um, great attractions throughout the county as well. Arabia Castle's just put a lot of money into their Plotless Forest to make them more family friendly. And the clue there in terms of that's probably something the city needs to look at as well. We need to be perhaps more family friendly if we can. The Boers Museum, again, always does very, very well uh, in Brown Castle, the Open Project. Unprecedented uh, investment gone into um, a whole raft of attractions. The Faith Centre being the last of those opening next year, uh, but the Miners Gallery, the Spanish Gallery, uh, and obviously the, the general of the town is going uh, over, over, really just going into a completely different place. Uh, and that will hopefully bring um, a lot of investment uh, into, uh, the, into that part of the county as well. Um, I've noticed a, a ripple effect of uh, this accommodation developers now contacting us to find out which accommodation should they build in and around Bishop Auckland? So that ripple effect of if you build attractions, people think not now go there for a day visit, I'd like to stay overnight. So the portfolio of attractions throughout the city and the county is, is quite important now. And I would say, as we go through this list, um, we have some of the best large attractions now uh, and probably the strongest portfolio in the, the whole of the Northeast of England. And that's quite a big thing to say because there are some fantastic attractions around the Northeast. But with the money that's gone into all the big attractions now, I think we have the strongest portfolio. The Durham Deal is obviously uh, beautiful, uh, outdoor and active. Dark skies are becoming very, very popular. Great outdoors. We have some fabulous uh, scenery. Uh, the Durham Coast, who would have thought? Um, Seam and Marina Town are doing very, very well in tourism. Um, and we also have some great events. And then on to my, one of my uh, babies, the, uh, the Northern Saints Trails. I've got a couple of pop-ups there. And you've also got um, the, your complimentary copy uh, of the model by the chap in the front uh, <laughs> um, of your um, Northern Saints Guide. This is a project where um, Durham is not only leading for the city, for the county. Um, I pulled together all our regional partners from the whole of the northeast of England, and we lead this for the whole of the northeast of England. So I pulled my counterparts together, the councils and their marketing officers, uh, we locked them all in the room, and we came up with some uh, great uh, research from the cathedral um, on some routes that would be good to develop uh, and, and just um, animate. And we came up with six routes, and they come all the way from uh, the north of North Wind, right down to Hartlepool, across to Hexham, uh, and right in the thick of it, obviously, Durham City. So we've kind of loaded the dice in terms of tourism coming to Durham and, and Durham City and County Durham. Um, but obviously these trails are built on the strong foundations of Christian heritage. Uh, but what we want to do is also put a modern twist on the uh, meaning of pilgrimage. People often say, um, and a good example is like, I'm going to uh, Liverpool on Beatles pilgrimage. They use that word, Pilgrimage. So we've uh, tried to make the word pilgrimage much more interchangeable with people's interests. Um, so it's free. Any journey of significance. It could be about heritage. It could be about landscape. It could be about bird watching. It could be about exercise. 
So essentially we're giving all of our visitors the potential tools on these six trails to pick and choose what they want to do. And that could be over in Sullen, for example, they might want to go and see the National Glass Centre, they'll pop into St Peter's, and then on their mobile phone, they can also see there's a lovely cafe across the road as well while they're on tour. So people can pick and mix what they want to do in any direction, in any length. And there are 205 miles uh, of routes across the six. Um, I think I've done about 40, 45 miles so far, so I need to get to get cracking on the rest of that. But it really has, um, it, it's done very, very well. Um, and I think what's got us a lot of coverage nationally and internationally is that modern twist on pilgrimage. We've been, 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 been able to say that um, yeah, the, the core, uh, we obviously have the saints, we have the Christian heritage, but we can also interchange that with uh, lots and lots of other things. I think I must have a bit of a, uh, an old saints problem. I, was, I went to Bede School in Sunderland. Um, I now live on St Cuthbert's Avenue. And I just have a new son, and his, new, his middle name is Aidan. So I think I've gotten a bit too far already. So it's, <laughs> um, so it's uh, yeah, I think I've really got into it. Um, Here's some of the coverage um, so far, uh, 700,000 pounds worth of media coverage. Uh, and there's just some of the titles that we've achieved. We've also got into some uh, broadcast media nationally as well, um, uh, in Australia and in this country as well, the Songs of Praise covered it. So it's, it's went enormously well. And the good news is the World Heritage Site is at the core of this. Uh, and we've managed to find a new way uh, of getting more people onto walking routes. And it's also quite a timely theme as well. What we found is a lot of research post pandemic, people want to think about well being, they want to think about exercise, they want to get fresh air, um, and they want to explore some of the great things that we have to offer within the county and the region. So I think we've, we've, we've hit this just right. Um, and then I just want to move on a few last few slides. Uh, exciting times ahead. We can't rest on our laurels. There's some very, very good destinations out there nationally who have some fantastic. Uh, attractions, so we need to keep reinventing, investing um, appropriately. And obviously, we've got the Stockton Darling Railway coming. The Land of Oak and Iron has done very, very well over in the northwest of the county. Um, the top right pitch that's the Plotters Forest um, um, vision um, for the um, River Castle. So, family, family oriented, very exciting. Bottom left, you have the AONB uh, Visitor Center, all these. Um, in the middle, at uh, bottom, you'll also find obviously Crook Hall, just going over National Trust. We've been trying to get a National Trust product here as for as long as I've been with Visiting Out Town. So it's, it's fantastic to finally get one in the bag because there was a, a whacking big gap in the map in terms of County Durham. So that's good to see. Grasshorn, we've got an observatory uh, now over there in the west of the county to take advantage of some of the best dark skies in the country. Uh, and then, so the Weirdale Museum, uh, bottom right as well, got some funding. <coughs> Almost there, Durham Distillery. I saw a few of you uh, take some more interest there. Uh, that's obviously on the way as well. And again, something that's distinctively Durham. And again, that's very important from the market perspective. What's distinctively Durham in this? And there's nothing more distinctly Durham, obviously, than the World Heritage Site. Um, we, we're also look, working with uh, looking at some early scope work on the crime and punishment theme in Durham City as well. There are quite a few attractions around the UK who have attractions on this theme. Um, they probably don't have as much. Uh, in depth history and heritage in this theme uh, as we do as a city. So I'll have some exploratory chats with uh, HMP in Durham, uh, the university, the police, the cathedral as well, and a few other partners just to find out what's there. And we also sponsored some heritage open days on the theme. Um, they all sold out, we could have done twice as many. So that's quite interesting. Um, we also got the, um, the, the story uh, of uh, developing it as well to take the archives, six miles of archives of the country underneath County Hall up to the, uh, the story. Um, and obviously, have to mention Red Hills, nice little segue to Nick, who's joining us as well. So really, really uh, exciting times ahead. And I will stand and take questions. Thank you, very interesting to get that professional's view after the local's view. So, any questions for Craig? Yes, Gary. Um, yeah, thanks, Craig. I was going to mention that uh, you make the point there that the risk to spend here is smaller than you'd like. I'm assuming, therefore, if, if more people spend, therefore the attractions can continue to grow and possibly uh, expand further. 
Uh, but then there's always a dilemma when you say steel knife because the hotel capacity going isn't good. And every time there's a talk of building new hotel, people in this group criticize it. Where's the, where's the compromise there? I think the compromise to some extent is um, obviously that word sustainability it means different things to different people. Um, it can mean um, about the sustainability of the, the environment. It could be about buildings. It could be about jobs. So there is, yeah, there is a compromise to try and strike there. Um, I think there's also, there's one thing you can do in terms is trying to find that way of making the destination um, more, more seasonally spread. Um, because quite often there are, there are hot spots during the week and during the year where the city is having to cope with more visitors than others. So a lot of our campaigns are very much geared towards the shoulder months and the quieter times of the week. So I think there's a way of trying to spread the load and the benefits uh, and there, there are impacts and there are benefits. Um, so I think, yeah, there is a, a way of trying to do that. Um, and I think there's also, um, there is a, a way of trying to balance that um, 10,000 jobs, um, 450, 450 uh, viable businesses and protect what we have at its core in the city and the county with buildings. So I think you, and it's the same with the, the North Pennines OMB, they're very, very protective, quite rightly, um, of the landscape and their and they have ways of trying to manage that, and we have to do the same. So when we do the Durham Tourism Management Plan, uh, we invite all different shades of interest into the room to make sure we've got a, a good rounded way of looking at the destination. End of the day, if you don't look after the destination and its, and its assets, that horribly crude word, um, then people won't come. And there's lots of examples. Tarmelinus in Spain, a good example where it went so far the other way, um, you actually lost uh, what you were trying to attract people to. So it's about trying to make sure you don't um, kill the golden goose, really. Anyone else? Yes. Talk about and destinations. That implies travel. Uh, um, what um, you haven't talked at all about the sort of travel links and particularly if you're trying to integrate the city with the county, how does the, the, the travel link? We're, we're just reviewing our tourism mind plan at the moment, and that's come up as being, <clears throat> how say, top five or top six uh, things raised, where uh, being raised. Obviously, for the city, we have the excellent link, rail links. That's not a lot of use at the moment with the, <laughs> the other. Um, so that's been a bit of a challenge. But obviously, we will always try to work with rail providers to get, to get more people here by rail uh, and try and minimize some of the car uh, trouble. There, there is, yeah, and I think you're looking to the connectivity to the rest of the county. That there is a real challenge. I mean, to get from Durham City to Barnet Castle, best part of the day. And yeah. um, so we, we've been talking to quite a lot of the bus providers. Um, they're under enormous pressure because they have taken an enormous hit um, in terms of what's happened with the pandemic for two years. They've got government help, but they've taken an enormous hit. Um, so the, the case uh, has to be prime to be made on how we can find ways. Of, uh, because you, there are a couple of examples. The Havens Wall bus is a good example. There's a Dales bus also in Yorkshire. Um, and these are, are built on a model of uh, building things that connect attractions, but also help people get to work. So I think it has to be that word sustainability again. So I think it's about trying to find models where uh, the, the bus providers can, can, can earn a living. And some of them, obviously, you know, they have, they have to earn a living, they have to pay salaries at the same time, how we can sustain communities and attractions. So that this is, it has certainly come centre stage, I can reassure you, the next tourism management plan, which we hope to publish next spring, uh, that the transport issue has come out loud and clear. Um, but we obviously don't have funding ourselves, but it's, it's very much about trying to persuade um, the, the, the council teams and also the bus providers that do, um, that it's, it'd be a good investment. And it's, and, it, and it's all about trying to say, connect all those attractions and, and, uh, and let's those communities. And I think that anything that comes forward has to be able to be for residents who want to get about for their jobs and for visitors. You, you, in the real world, you're not going to produce a, a, a visitor bus that takes people around now. That's just simply not viable. Is that okay? Yeah. Hi, um, I think it kind of recognised that one of like the plus points for somebody. Like visiting the county is actually talking to people who live here when they're at various attractions, whether it's in the shop or in the there's a tour guide or whoever kind of they meet when they visit here. Has you give us numbers for how you think actually works 
Custom Council service. Is there any leaders to hand in people actually volunteer a Custom Council um, the, the, we know how many work at obviously the, the cathedral and the Beamish are probably the biggest recruiters of, uh, and they're a huge part um, of, of, um, of the economy. Uh, my, my, my sister uh, um, literally has got the t-shirt, the court, and all the merchandise from just from about 40 or 50 side, and I know this, this world quite well. Um, it, they're, they're an enormous part uh, of the mix and a lot of attractions um, uh, are very, very dependent on them and would be lost without them. Um, it is actually uh, not just um, what's happened with the economy recently, um, but also um, a lot of there is a shortage of skilled staff, not just paid, but also volunteers. Um, and obviously, the attractions are having to almost compete for volunteers, which is good good for the volunteers. So it means that uh, there's more TLC for them because they need to be looked after. You can't just say turn up and do this. You have to look after them. You have to give them something as well. So I think. Um, they're an enormous part of the mix and the many attractions, especially the, the big ones and some of the small charity ones would be absolutely lost without them. But, but they need the skills and they need to be looked after. Well, we don't know a lot of the big, um, there's no research we've done into any, how many there actually I, 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 th I think there are other organisations that might know about because obviously some of the, open, the, the volunteers are doing things that, that are not tourism related as well. Yeah. But it, it might be worth us trying to find a way of, of calculating that at some point. It's not a bad point. Thank you. Roger? Yeah, um, looking at your room for improvement um, bullet points, one of them would be visitor information forms. We used to have a tourist information office in Scotland, and I wonder if it's time to bring that back because you know, obviously there's dissatisfaction there. I think there's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. the, the, the visitor has changed, the economy has changed. Um, the tourism vigilance that have been um, something that's been a challenge for lots of destinations around the UK, and many of them have closed, but not unusual. Uh, they're an enormous investment. Um, and I know a lot of um, the, the staff that work in the old tourist information centre um, are still one or two of them still working with us. Um, and I know quite a lot of their inquiries were about bus timetables for local people from Durham to Saxon. That isn't really tourism. So I think I think that that was um, the, the visitors have changed in their needs. They will do more things on social media. They'll do more things on the website. So what we tried to do was to put the information, especially the print and some of the information points, the, the digital ones, into the attractions and into the place to eat uh, and into the hotels. So we went to, took the information to them. So I think it's it's partly a mixture of um, they're an enormous investment we probably couldn't afford, and the other track other destinations have done exactly the same. But also, I think the visitor need for information, how they get information, is very, very different now. Um, they will, they will generally go on their mobile phone, um, and that's and that's of all age, all age ranges. Um, so I think um, we developed a, a network of visit information points around the city and the county. And obviously, some great work done by the pointers as well in the city. Um, so I think it's about trying to make sure we try and take the, the information to the visitors as best we can as well. Um, I know I'm distributing um, the guy that you've got, um, uh, leaflets around the, the region. Uh, that cost about £3,000 to distribute that. Um, but it was well worth it because we had hundreds and hundreds of destinations right throughout the, the, the northeast of England. So I think that's the, the, probably the best way I can answer it, really. <clears throat> so there's a follow up question. Sorry. I think this one will run and run, and we haven't got time. <coughs> Percy, one more question, then we need to move on. I'd just like to add to that. My question was going to be the same one about the visitor information centre. And um, I think that it wasn't simply a, a place where visitors went to find out where the, where the cathedral was, for instance. Uh, but the thing about Durham is it's very small. It doesn't have the same problems that other um, centers of destinations have, where they've got lots of streets and lots of places where they might have a visitor information center. We had a perfect position to us. And it was also a hub for the residents and other organizations within the city to advertise their own um, organization, what was going on. It was a really important thing. 
and it can simply be dismissed as sorry as as something which is uh, no long, no longer necessary because I believe it is. Sorry. Oh, that's, well, that's fine. That's just, that's <laughs> A message for you to take away, Craig. I wish I, I, wish I, had, I, wish I had a million pounds myself, but I still don't know. There are other ways of looking at it. Thank you very much indeed You're for a very good time. presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Right. We are slipping a little bit behind on the timetable, so apologies for appearing to push. The next presentation is a joint one from the Parish Council and one of our trustees. So from the Parish Council we have Grenville Holland who chairs the planning committee and trustee Sue Childs who was also one of the key people in preparing the neighbourhood plan. So Grenville, Sue, over to you. I come first in this duo on behalf of the Parish Council, uh, followed by Sue, who will discuss the neighbourhood plan in a little more detail. From our point of view, planning in a diverse city such as Durham, a city which is an all-consuming and rapidly expanding university, a city which acts as the administrative centre of the county, and a city which lies under the shadow of its cathedral and its world heritage status, is a combination which offers many challenges if its fabric and its historic setting is to be protected. Until recently, in a city unprepared for the rapidly changing patterns of its evolution in such a spatially restricted area, the protection was inadequate. For too many years, too little was available to those who are concerned about the damaging impact of the relentless, almost unrestricted changes that were taking place. Changes which were to the detriment to both the fabric of the city and to the lives of the many residents who had long occupied its closely knit center. Unfortunately, much of the damage that has been done in the last 25 years can no longer be undone. However, recently, a welcome clutch of material planning documents has become available to those seeking to protect our city from yet further damaging incursions, whose only real person often has been no more than short-term commercial gain. First, we have the 2021 MPPF as an upgrade of a useful, if rather broadband and at times vague, national planning document. Secondly, after a decade of toil, the 2020 County Durham Plan now provides a generally well-drafted document and offers much more formidable defense against the regular flow of unsuitable planning proposals that continue to appear on our desks. And third, the City of Durham Neighborhood Plan also provides an additional and invaluable arm of protection for our city. In interpreting these three planning arms, we regularly work closely with the City of Durham Trust, who provide us with invaluable support and advice. Turning to the neighborhood plan, it is a triumph of local endeavor, determination, hard work and patience, which took nine years to reach its successful completion in 2021. The creation of this local plan was triggered by two major issues at the time. First, there was the threatened housing development at Mount Oswald, now almost complete. It was a golf course on the western edge of the city. And secondly, the eruption of HMOs that were ruthlessly consuming many socially valuable family homes as a university, once it had been freed from the UG constra UGC constraints, 
rapidly expanded without any regard to its consequences on the community that it shared. With the blessing of the County Council in 2014, a neighborhood plan forum was created. And in May 2018, the newly formed City of Durham Trust, sorry, sorry, City of Durham Parish Council became the statutory body for this neighborhood plan. And we're proud to be attached to it. The process of its creation required teamwork of the highest order, as the project was organized into six themes and those who led them became almost household names in this city. John Lowe, who is sitting on my right hand here, led on sustainability as the golden thread. Pippa Bell focused on economy. John Ashby brought, this, he brought his expertise to housing. Matthew Phillips took responsibility for sustainable transport. Roger Cornwall addressed community. David Miller and Angela Tracy looked towards a creative and sustainable city. Anne Evans was concerned with heritage. And finally, but by no means less, less important, Sue Childs focused on the green infrastructure. Um, I did, in preparing these notes, asked um, for an amusing anecdote to soften the hardness of what I'm saying. <laughs> And I was told that nothing funny happened during their time together, <laughs> which I also find rather funny too. Um, as one of the players said to me, it was a long, a very long slog, pretty much all consuming from 2014 to 2020. And what a magnificent team it was that made this long, hard journey to success. To all of them, in the city, we are profoundly grateful. Which leads me to our main speaker and a member of the, that magnificent team, Lou Charles. Thank you very much, Renville, and blushing for all this, and <laughs> to all my colleagues for the lovely words that you've said. Well, most this. of the people Grenville mentioned are in this room today. Um, so I follow on with that, just give you some brief details about how the Durham City Neighbourhood Plan supports the World Heritage Site. Um, a little bit of background. Neighbourhood plans came out in the Localism Act of 2011, and the aim was that local people should have more say in planning matters. And Grenda's already talked about the fact that we've got this hierarchy of planning requirements, planning policies, planning guidance. And at the national level, the national planning policy uh, framework, it sets out the government's economic, environmental and social planning policies for England. Then we move down to the local authorities where we have the local plans and they're about creating a strategy for the local authority area, but also um, contextualizing what's in the uh, NPPF. Then we come down to neighborhood plans. Um, they have to be in general conformity with the two higher levels of the plan. But what they're doing is giving a much more finer grain detail about what happens in a much more smaller area. And we've got the County Durham Plan, as Grenville says, and the Durham City Neighbourhood Plan. And what these plans are doing, they are being used to assess development proposals. So very important. And I think in other presentations, people have mentioned how important it is that planning plays a role in this city. The plan area, very roughly, I mean, the plan area corresponds to the area of the parish council. Roughly, it's the boundaries given by the River Weir and the River Barony, and then cutting across in the north, just above um, Akeley Heads. And it's a very complex area because it's got the World Heritage Site, the city centre, the university, two conservation areas, and many, many other important facilities. So you can imagine the complexities of how you develop a neighborhood plan for such a complex and such an important area. And it's intricately, intimately related to the World Heritage Site. 
And in this area of the neighborhood plan, we have the World Heritage Site itself, but also we have its setting. Um, the inner bowl, which will be the historic core of the city, uh, the city conservation area, but also that first ring of views that you can have to and from the World Heritage Site. And then we've got part of also this outer bowl, which is the wider area where you've got various ridges, hills, that give a backdrop to the World Heritage Site and the kind of views that you could have to and from the site. And then talking about producing the plan, which Grenville's already talked about, and I won't go into uh, our experiences of the process. Started in 2014, and the plan was finally um, uh, authorised in 2021. When we started off with the plan, there was no parish council, so we had to set up an official neighbourhood planning forum, and that comprised volunteers who lived and worked in the city. Now, neighbourhood plans are produced from the bottom up, so community involvement is really crucial to this process. We have the volunteers working um, doing the work, but also we needed the community feedback. The first um, initial priority consultation asked the question, what is good about Durham City? And the top two responses were the World Heritage Site and the Riverbank setting. And another popular response was the green wedges that bring in greenery, wildlife, and the countryside into the city. We carried out many more consultations during the uh, process of producing the plan. And that was to ensure that what we finally arrived at did match the views of the community. When the parish council was created in 2018, they took over managing the neighborhood plan process and the volunteers from the forum then became a working party in the parish council. So all the policies in the neighborhood plan of course are relevant to a World Heritage Site, but the one theme that is particularly relevant is the theme a beautiful and historic city. And this comprises two sub-themes. One is heritage, which is basically the built environment. And the other sub-theme is the green landscape. Um, at the beginning slide of this presentation, I gave a link to the full plan document. And for each policy, you get contextual information, you get a very detailed um, plan, a third very detailed policy itself. You get explanation about the policy justification. I can't give any of that kind of detail at a talk like this. And so I can just give very brief um, ideas about these policies in, in this theme that I've mentioned. Um, before I go into policies particularly, all of them you notice, the, the, most of them you notice the phrasing of protection and enhancement. So we're not just trying to uh, freeze the city, you know, as, as, a, as a fossil. We're also talking about how you can improve it into the future. So it's a future looking idea of policies. Um, in the heritage sub theme, there's three uh, policies. Protection and enhancement of the World Heritage Site. And that's about um, supporting the site's outstanding universal value and supporting its current management plan. It's about if any, if any building developments occur in that area, they've got to contribute to the significance of the site. And very importantly, and this has been mentioned by many, many people, it's about protecting important views to and from the World Heritage Site, but also providing opportunities to open up either lost views or new views and vistas. Uh, policy H2, the conservation areas. This is, this is the Durham City conservation area and the Burn Hall conservation area. And it's a really key policy for the city. Um, it's about how to get high quality building design for new developments. Um, that 
take uh, into account the, the historical and the architectural qualities of the existing buildings in the area, but also to talk about what could be new designs, but these new designs being um, sympathetic and contributing to the significance of the area, contributing to the landscape, and also about protecting the open spaces and the views within the built environment and that kind of wider kind of landscape. And then finally, there's policy H3, which looks at the neighborhood outside the conservation area, which is important because it does form part of that inner bowl. And it's important that though, though the buildings there are more modern, they still have a distinctiveness and a character that needs to be respected. If we move into the other sub theme, the green infrastructure, there's four policies there. One of the key ones is uh, policy G1, which is about protecting and enhancing green and blue infrastructure. So you're looking there at green and, looking at green and blue assets, you're looking at public rights of way, other footpaths, green corridors, biodiversity, geological features, the riverbanks and dark corridors. Then another very important um, policy, G2, the designation of local green spaces. And local green spaces give the same level of protection mm -hmm. against unsuitable developments as the green belt does, or <coughs> as the green belt is supposed to do. <laughs> um, we know some of the problems with that. And the ones that have been made local green spaces, it's the River Weir, River Weir Corridor in the areas of the peninsular woodlands, which obviously is key to the cathedral and the castle, the race course and the stands. Uh, it's Observatory Hill, and somebody else has already mentioned how important that is as an iconic uh, place to view the World Heritage Site. Bow Cemetery, Clay Lane, Flas Vale and New Haven <coughs> allotments, St. Margaret's Cemetery and allotments, the Durham Light Infantry Grounds, the, the woods um, around one edge of the city, Maiden Castle Woods, Great High Wood, Hollingside Wood, and Blaze Wood, and the Nettles Cross Battlefield. Um, Policy GT is about creation of the Emerald Network. And this is the idea of creating um, footpaths and connections of all the sites of wildlife interests in the city. And other people have already mentioned other types of trails and footpath um, developments in the city. And finally, policy G4, which is about enhancing the beneficial use of the green belt. And that's in the areas of the Sidegate and Franklin Lane area and the area west of the A167 from Brownie Bridge up to Neville's Cross. And how have we in the plan sort of contributed to the wider work of UNESCO's? Back in July 2021, um, John Lowe and Jane Gibson and myself, we gave a presentation at the celebration of the 10th anniversary of, this is a very long title, of the 2011 UNESCO Historic Urban Landscape Recommendation. And we talked about how neighborhood plans can support <coughs> World Heritage Sites. And because of that presentation, we were then, they then had an interest in Durham City. And we have had published by UNESCO uh, uh, as a case study in their Heritage and Sustainable Development Programme. And the title of that case study is Community-Led Urban Planning in Durham. And then finally, sort of looking to the future. The, the neighbourhood plan is now being used by the council and by people like ourselves and the trust to assess uh, planning proposals. So, so it's, having, it's, it's doing its work. Um, all plans have to be updated, have to be refreshed. And the neighborhood plan runs from 2020 to 2035. So part of the role of the parish council is to look at how 
The neighbourhood plan is being used, what its impact is on developments, is it being effective or not? And then to use that information to refresh the plan, but also to look at how the plan can further support the World Heritage Site in changing contexts. Um, there is more to what happened when we produced the neighbourhood plan than the final neighbourhood plan document itself. Because when we did all these consultations, there were many issues that were raised by the local community that couldn't be put into a planning document. They just didn't fit into what um, a planning document is allowed to contain. So we didn't want to lose that. So we've put that into a companion document called Looking Forwards. And this document has been officially recognised and adopted by the Irish Council. And it contains a lot of initiatives which call for action by um, the Parish Council, by community groups and by individuals to work on improving and developing the city. And there's one initiative that the Trust is starting to take forward. Just an example of what's in that document, and that's Initiative 5, Identification, Protection and Enhancement of Heritage Assets, Green Assets and Views in Durham City. And I, I think what I take from that is how important views are to the city. And I think it's it sort of reinforced my idea from what other people have been saying and comments from the floor about the importance of views. So that's something for the future. Well, thank you very much. The picture that cropped up there of people working on the neighbourhood plan on the green bays tables, uh, some of you will recognise that was in Red Hills. <laughs> and we're, we're very grateful to the Durham Miners Association. We met there every week, once a week. And it wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a great team, and it's nice to be reminded of it. Yeah, we are. Anyway, I digress. Um, Sue gave us a very interesting presentation there. Are there any questions, please? When the, um, you, you did say this, and I'm not sure I've picked it up properly. When something is defined as a green asset, does it then have sort of a higher level of protection? Yes, than... it, it, the protection is equivalent to what protection a green, an area in the green belt received. Right. So it's about protecting it from unsuitable development, basically. And is it a very high level of, of requirement on that. Protected from unsuitable farming practices? No, unfortunately. Yeah, I think you know what I'm going yes. to. <laughs> And unfortunately, what it doesn't do is the owner can use that land for the purposes that they were currently using it for, if it's farming, for example. Um, what, what the local green plan, local green space does is it's about further development. So buildings or um, I don't know, turning it into a into a jalopy race course or something yeah. like that. But a, a change of type of farming is happened on the Tree Hill, mm. which is... I think that this is uh, this is one of the issues about how far planning and planning law yeah. can take you to protect <coughs> something or not. And that, that's really a dilemma and that's, that's really why the Looking Forwards document came into place because not everything can planning do for you. Yeah. Mm. John? Two, uh, a very easy question. Uh, <laughs> what does, do you think, uh, tell us about planning? That there are very, very large new buildings in the city that uh, most people would say, how did they allow that? <laughs> Most of a, a very good question. I, th I think it's really it should be you answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> as, as a non planner, what, what I gave from this is that though, that though you can write a policy and you can be as careful as you can to make that policy 
the wording of the policy as strong as you can. When it comes to uh, these uh, discussions in the planning committee, it comes down to interpretation. And it's how far you want to push interpretation into one direction or to another. I don't know whether you find that's a fair, fair comment. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from one of the people attending via Zoom, uh, which is, um, is there enough accommodation for university students now? Um, with, uh, <laughs> um, to the news recently. This is the other issue that, as you <laughs> notice, this, this drove the neighbourhood plan. Um, I think John, John Ashby might know that, that probably if you talk about all the PBSAs, there actually is enough accommodation in the city, but not everybody wants or can afford to live in the private PBSAs because of the, the costs and also because lots of people prefer to live in the HMOs. Um, so that is the issue. However, you've got to also remember that this is a city with a local residence. And what you've got to try and do is, is develop a fair, proportionate, um, sustainable pattern of, of housing between residents and students. And the issue that came up in the, it's not a policy that we can have in the neighborhood plan, it came up in the county plan. And that is that in areas where there isn't already um, almost 100% student accommodation, you can't go above 10% of the housing in that area being student properties. So this is when people want to take um, existing uh, houses and turn them into HMOs, that's housing of multiple of occupation. So I think it's going to be a, uh, no, it's always been an issue in the city and it's going to be an ongoing issue in the city and I don't know how, how you solve such an issue. I'm not standing up to solve it. <laughs> I was about to say it needs a whole conference of its own, it's a very complex <laughs> it is, issue. It is. Are you going to solve it? A question which might be uh, directed uh, by the friend of you. Um, does the power council have a, a loose handover when they might be reviewing the neighborhood plan? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Roger. Well, so what we're trying to build up an evidence base. Um, in fact, the 2021 census has just been published last week. And we'll be looking at that to try and see what changes have taken place over the last 10 years. And that would be one of the part of the evidence base that we go through. It's probably going to be about another four years before it gets to the conversation. Good, thank you very much. Well, we'll, we'll move on. Thanks very much indeed, Sue. And <laughs> So you have a, a picture on, on the screen, it's about to disappear, of Red Hills. Uh, it's a timely introduction um, for uh, Ross Forbes. We might one day have two World Heritage Sites in the city, which might seem astonishing, but Red Hills has started the long process of seeking inscription by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ross Forbes, who's leading on that process. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Um, and, and a big thank you for the invitation to come and address you today. Uh, and I know that as a trust, you have supported Red Hills and its, um, its uh, bid for National Heritage Lottery funding, um, which we are just in the process of securing. Um, Nick Mullion, my colleague, will, will um, talk about this. Nick is the chief executive of the Red Hills CIO, which is a Red Hills charity, uh, and he'll take you through where we're at with the, um, the, the lottery bid, etc. But my job today is to answer this, um, who would have thought it, question. <laughs> um, I'm not a native of Durham, 
I was born in Hartlepool in 1957, and after two life-threatening bouts of bronchial pneumonia, persuaded my dad that we should move to Jarsgate Moor. <laughs> um, so between pen penicillin and going with fresh air, I'm standing here talking to you. Um, Jarsgate Moor is very important because both me and Nick are from Jarsgate Moor, the ruffians you know, out there in <laughs> the city, and are now, uh, between the two of us, taking forward not only the UNESCO bid, but um, the renovation and renewal of the Miners Hall. This is not the Miners Hall, by the way. Um, where is it? How do we do that? This is. <clears throat> so the title is Who Would Have Thought It? Because we started the project uh, for Red Hills in 2016 after two failed attempts to get lottery funding for it. It's known as Durham's hidden gem. So in terms of views, which you just heard about, you can't see this until we walk through the front gates. Um, our job is to bring this back uh, to its rightful place, to be recognizable as a world icon for not just the bricks and mortar, because it is quite beautiful. It's what it stands for is the important thing. And we'll talk about this a bit further. So how, how did all of this happen? Um, I think it was one Friday afternoon, Nick and I received uh, an email saying uh, there's an international call for what they call workers' assemblies halls, um, and they want to uh, put this forward to UNESCO as being of world heritage status. What? What, what does this mean? So we wrote back to these people, let me just go back a bit um, very quickly. This is the ceiling, because it's the nicest bit of the Workers' Assemblies Hall in, um, or the Workers' Museum rather, in Copenhagen. They're the people who are organizing this on behalf of the Danish government, because the Danish government thinks that the, uh, what organized labor has done over the years makes a significant contribution to the civilization of the world. And you'd expect me to say this, but I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> Um, so we have been working with them over the past year uh, alongside the eight other people on the shortlist. The Danish government did a scan of the whole world and found about 74 potential candidates and narrowed that down to eight. Now this one you're looking at is actually a building. It's in Buenos Aires and it's the if I get the Spanish pronunciation right, it's the C D A T, um, <laughs> which is sort of the, the Argentinian version of the United Union, um, built in the 1930s. There's other ones in Helsinki, uh, in Ghent, in Belgium, two in Australia, one in Canada, uh, and the search is still on. The key, the key criteria is that these buildings must come from an organized labor source which indeed Red Hills did. It was built on the pennies and the halfpennies of the subscriptions of the Durham miners. And all of these have had to do the same, which means it rules out uh, the workers' palaces in the former Soviet Union and a lot of the Eastern Bloc uh, in China, uh, because these are all governmental. These have come from the root. We're being assisted with this, thank the Lord, uh, because it's so lot complex, we didn't realize what we're getting into by um, Sebastian's uh, group and principally Robin Cunningham, who's our own tame uh, UNESCO chair. For those of you who know him, he specializes in uh, Nepalese temples and things like this, but he's turned his attention to help us out with the Red Hills project. And he thinks that we've got a very, very good chance of uh, being successful. So again, who would have thought it? Durham's hidden gem, uh, the, what was, the crumbling miners' hall in Red Hills, Durham, suddenly could be the second um, World Heritage Site for very different reasons, but it does mirror the fact that County Durham is known for Christianity and coal in that chronological order. But we have a long road to travel, and the first bit we have to do is prove that Red Hills is the outstanding example of a workers' assembly hall in the UK. Are we going to be able to do that? I think so. <laughs> so um, there we go. This was all, it was opened in 1915. I'll, I'll do this at pace because a lot of you have heard this before, I think. 
um, as the second mine as well, the first one is in complete disrepair in North Road. Uh, once we get this done, we'll <laughs> see what we can do with North Road. <laughs> but that's uh, another long road to travel. Um, and in terms of its architecture, it doesn't have a parallel, certainly within um, the, the UK. But it's what happened inside it and around it is the, is the important thing of the values for the UNESCO um, application. Along the way, we picked up um, this handy little medal, which is um, Historic England, put us in uh, their 100 Irreplaceable Places category. Uh, I think, was this 2018? Yeah, I think it was 2018 we got this. And there's only, as you know, Red Hills is also known as the Pitman's Parliament. There's only one other parliament uh, within this category. Uh, and that's the Palace of Westminster, <laughs> which, uh, which I believe is having something like seven billion spent on it in terms of refurbishment. Uh, <laughs> We're currently scrabbling around to get 1.3 million to meet the inflation gap, but I'll leave that to Nick to talk to you about. Um, right. Inside, for those of you who've never been in, it doesn't look like this now because we've taken all the seats out, uh, ready for the refurbishment. This is the jewel in the crown within the uh, the Durham's hidden gem to keep all the jewellery stuff going. Um, and it's just beautiful. Those of you who've been in, it's, it's not just the beautiful joinery, it's the ambience and the, it, I call it the, the spiritual nature. Whether you're a person of faith or none, you walk in there and you feel something has happened there. It's quite an extraordinary building. Each one of those seats, and Sebastian won, won the prize for, <laughs> for the question I gave a talk to um, his group. Each one of those seats has a number on it, and each, each one of those numbers uh, relates to a colliery in the former Durham coalfield. So to pinch um, Nick's line, Red Hills is organised on a very, very human scale. Each one of those delegates had to go and argue their case for um, a welfare hall or uh, a community hospital to be built within their community. And there were over 300 communities in the real County Durham, which is from the South Bank of the Tide to the North Bank of the Tees, from the Pennines to the coast. Anybody here from, uh, south, from south Tyneside, whatever that might be? <laughs> That's County Durham, Gates, it's County Durham, Sunderland's County Durham. So all of these communities were represented, um, which is a sense of democracy and engagement and connectivity with these people which again is almost without parallel. You know, there's some debate about this, uh, but the delegates to the union in here in 1915 actually had a vote over their own political destiny uh, on a local level, in the political system that they'd made, but they did not have the vote in parliament because male universal suffrage did not come in until 1990. Mm -hmm. Same year that Durham County Council was the first Labour County Council uh, in the country. Uh, let's see how they fare in, in days to come, but never mind. Now, this is really important in terms of the antecedents of the Durham miners. One of the first things that they did in 1831 was go on strike and they won it. And that was to reduce the day, uh, the working day of boys like this. Obviously it's not photographed because they, they didn't have <laughs> cameras in those days. But this is an illustration of how children were put to work, um, really quite, you know, quite common. So they strike, they won it and they reduced the working day of boys, that's those up to 12, from 18 hours a day to 12 hours a day. It's quite, you know, it, it, it's, and then in 1832, on the royalties and the profits of coal, uh, this fabulous university was opened as you know, regarding, and it was built on the royalties of coal. So there's a beautiful juxtaposition between um, the, the church, the university, and the, the history of the Durham Miners, which all actually knits together to give you a holistic view of why this county is quite exceptional. This side of it has been woefully ignored for an awfully long time. So it's our job to resurface this in a way that we already find that people are finding a compelling story. They also got rid of what in uh, Durham Miners Association uh, was formed in 1869 in the Market Tavern, November the 20th, um, 1869. 
right? They, and they combined around to get rid of this, and it's called the bond. It was bonded labor. You had to sign it every year, and you were stuck with the colliery uh, owner and that colliery. You could not move your labor, whether you're uh, in a productive pit, mining lot of coal, or you're having the human sandstorm to get to the coal. Um, and they got rid of that on the basis that if you look carefully, most of these are signed with X's, thereby telling you that the miners were illiterate without writing skills. The legal case was that how can anybody sign a contract legal if you can't read it? So when the kids come into Red Hill school, the school children come in, um, Nick and the team give them a contract in Korean and say, sign that, and so not sign that. <laughs> um, and there's these lovely ways that you can, you can, you can bring um, quite important historical things to light by, by a bit of magic and trickery, isn't it, Nick? But anyway. Um, the DMA also supported its people through uh, times of great privation, not only war, but strike. Uh, this is the 1912 strike, which was throughout the Durham coal field, 21, 26, and then of course, 1984, 85, which was the, you know, the, the really last act of uh, the Durham coal field. And it disappeared, last pit shut in 1994. Red also sort of went into decline, 2016, and tried to pick it up and make something with a deep, deep and rich history. Um, um, so how have we been doing this? How have we been doing this? Yep. It, keep going. Right, right. Um, we started uh, to see what the building could offer people. It really before this had been a trading administration building. You had to get a letter uh, to get in to see the general secretary or the compensation secretary, uh, and you roll up in your your, your best bib and muffler, um, and it was legal, financial, and political never was open to the public. So how would it work? So one of the first things we did was this intensive week-long study for 10-year-olds, which started with the uh, facsimile of the 1842 um, Hansard report, if it was called Hansard in those days, of the uh, Mines Reform Act. You know, and the kids were asked, how old would you have to be to go down the coal mine? Oh, 30? Oh, 21? <laughs> No, no, 10. And um, so they were already of an age where they could have been down the mine. Um, and they explored during that week industrialization, unionization, the, um, the, uh, the chemical formula for methane. What does that do to you? Uh, and on and on. And at the end of it, they put a half hour play on of their learning of the week where they had all sorts of lovely stuff going on, including being blown up in a coal mine. Involved. <laughs> yeah. um, but at the end of it, they, they put together their Pittman's Parliament Manifesto, um, and it was absolutely breathtaking. These 10 year olds standing up in the Pittman's Parliament, a place, safe place for voice, and they're saying, no one should have to be a refugee. Be kind to animals, you know, straight backs, and, you know, no more plastics. And you, at that point, we realized this place speaks to people in a way that we don't even understand and that we can propagate this in a way that will attract people, not only to come and learn, but to, to debate, uh, to meet, conferencing. We realize we're probably, we're cracking a business plan here. Um, <laughs> driving the market. We did the same, uh, opened it up for uh, sixth form art students, and you can see they're interpreting the building. Without, uh, uh, they're, they're finding out this history themselves, and then they're producing artwork. Um, of their own volition. We, we didn't steer them. It was used in Lumiere, um, <clears throat> 2017, I think, um, as a, it was last, last year as well, but this was the biggie, which was a celebration of public service. And this is just what it looks like when it's got fantastic light projection on it. Obviously, you'll all recognize that as the um, images from the Durham Miners Gala which of course is the biggest event of its kind in the world. We don't ticket it, so we can only estimate, we think anywhere between 150,000, 200,000 people come. Um, an important, very, very important uh, aspect of the cultural life of the county. Um, so Red Hill's looking pretty different now, a fancy set of clothes on. 
Um, it's been given over to the uh, book festival and the women's section since the year and uh, centenary of women's suffrage. You can see how the Pitman Parliament you know, is really, really flexible and adaptable. Right, so what are we going to do with it? Do you want to take this on, Nick? Yeah, keep going on. The uh, plans? Okay. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> right, we have a plan uh, which is uh, holistic. Uh, to drive both the cultural aspects of it and give us a commercial life. This is what we call the Banner Cinema. Um, on the far side, you can see, and we have, we know we over 300 banners in existence still. We can store probably around about 35 to 45, and we'd like to store them in a way which they don't deteriorate. The made of silk, silk deteriorates anyway, go to Paul's Museum and look at outrageously expensive dress that's falling apart. The same <laughs> happens with, um, with that. So we can preserve those and store them in a way that people can read them and circulate them. <coughs> and we also want to be able to tell stories because the building is all about people telling stories to each other. And that's one of its core, core uh, assets. Really. So we will have in there uh, audio visual to the highest possible degree um, throughout the building. This is actually on the West Wing, uh, which we are trying to reinstate as part of the, the overall project. I'll leave that to Nick. Um, and the idea is you'll be able to come in and listen to multiple stories. Stories which uh, you know, will tell you what miners at war were about because miners were soldiers and soldiers are miners. You know, in 19, 1914, the Durham coal market uh, dropped by 40% because guess where it's exporting its coal to? Northern Germany. So the lads in Bishop Auckland were wherever sitting on the steps saying, oh, what should we do? Should we just wait, sit here and wait for the pit to wait? But now we're going to join our mates in France. So the DLI was forged uh, to, from the workforce that was heroic anyway. And then they did more heroism on the battlefield. We know there are more miners killed in the industry than were killed on either the first or the first or second world wars combined. So all of this, you know, I, I would say, Red Hills in so many ways uh, is not the last uh, piece in the jigsaw, but it's a very important piece of the jigsaw to make sense of what County Durham is and what the people of County Durham are. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and you can find anything you want in here if you know that. <laughs> uh, this is this is 72 cubic meters, and we have we have completed this task. Haven't we? Uh, 72 cubic meters of records, and these records, each one of them was about a person, and each person had a family, and each family had a community that they lived in. And you can look at one of them, and it just you can just start. I mean. For instance, I'll just very quickly give you one example. We found uh, a, um, the case, the legal case, a 23-year-old miner from Siam who was killed. He had a widow uh, and had two children. At that time, the uh, regulation was you had two months once you were widowed to get out of the house. And then another productive miner was put in. So, his widow is not only uh, grieving from the loss of her husband, she also then has to find somewhere else to live. The union took on that uh, um, case, found her somewhere else to live, and got her compensation for her husband's death. Now, that happened hundreds, thousands of times, over and over again. And it's all recorded in here somewhere. So uh, we have this in a lockup in Belmont, a very secret address, so you don't go and try nicking it. Um, the, and it will eventually end up in the History Centre uh, once that's reopened. And be properly catalogued and brought to life and be available uh, for people who are particularly interested in their antecedents and their family trees. And the stuff that you find out in all of this is quite hair raising sometimes. Okay. So, um, but that is all now out of the basement and in a safe place. And thank you all for that. Right, this is where I'm going to hand over to um, to Nick to update you on what's happening. 
Just the very last slide gives you uh, the timetable of when we think 
uh, we could get to UNESCO designation. Uh, we have a program of works worked out with the aforementioned uh, Robin Cunningham, uh, a master's uh, student, fortunately not Sebastian, but um, uh, will help us do all of that work about the comparative analysis. And maybe by 2025, there'll be a UNESCO designation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned Robin Cunningham because he's the UNESCO chair here and he, he's been valuable help to me in, in planning this program. Uh, he's, got, he's in Nepal as usual at the moment. <laughs> but, uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to pay tribute to him. And um, are there questions for either of these gentlemen? Adrian. I'm glad you mentioned the first line of thought on your phone. I think that really is mm. such an amazing kind of concept. Um, so I don't suppose you can say more than you said. It'd be wonderful if something can be done with that one. Well, um, interestingly, we'll have to take this into account in uh, the UNESCO application because somebody's going to say, well, what happened to the first one? Um, and well, it was 1880, it was opened, wasn't it? So uh, then abandoned pretty much when they moved up, up the road. Uh, I don't have a lot of personal knowledge about it other than until recent years when it was what? A nightclub, a fruit veg market, a bicycle repair shop. So it's gone through multiple uses. Um, Nick, you know a bit more about the ownership of it. Yes, um, so, so the ownership is much like the rest of that end of North Road within a particular family's investment portfolio. Um, and there's a local property management company who look after it uh, on a commercial basis and are struggling to find a commercial life for it. Um, so as Ross says, it's sort of a watching brief at the moment for us. But um, I, I, I visited, um, I know what it's like in its current condition. And just in terms of the UNESCO designation, I think um, when we, when, if they ask the question why Red Hills and not the first line at all, um, I think uh, the criteria around intactness is probably going to be the, the key, uh, <laughs> the key uh, differential there. Lucy? I think the uh, bicycle shop would have stayed in the minor or minor at all if the rent had not gone up. So mm -hmm. I think for the owners, they're just charging part of that rent, which is a problem mm -hmm. inhibiting the development of lots of new yeah. to create a community. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Really and North Road would be the perfect home for those sorts of independent businesses. Uh, having in my previous uh, role from an art studios, which some people here would be familiar with. Above the bus station for three, four years, um, we couldn't find a home for our community 25 artists because of the uh, commercial viability, questions around commercial viability, you know, premises of their One question I'd like to ask, if, if I may, is how you envisage Red Hills as a World Heritage Site, cohering, as it were, with Durham Cathedral and Castle as a World Heritage Site. Do you see any symbiosis? Do you see Envisage a relationship, or do you, do you just be another World Heritage site that happens to be in the same city? Do you want me yeah, to first start up there. <laughs> um, well, I think to answer your question, John, is we already have good relations, relationships with both university and cathedral. Um, they've just improved since we've been at the Red Hills recent project. So we're pretty knitted in. Um, I think in terms of what does that mean as a coherent offer, there's a bit more stitching to do in terms of how has the symbiosis of that history and heritage grown up together, because it's both adversarial and collaborative at the same time. It's a complex relationship. Um, I think there's, a, there's an even broader story to talk about the built environment of Durham, the bits of it, but then the board of county, how did it come to be? Uh, I, I think I've, I've said before, I think you can tell the story of the rise and fall of the British Empire uh, and much beyond that in County Durham itself, because it's such an important engine for the development of the Western world. And if we get clever about that and then start finding ways of attracting more visitor interest into not necessarily the deep history, 
but that broad meaning of how it all comes together as a, a coherent community, including Tyneside uh, and Wearside, I just think it's a fascinating world exemplar, really, of how to do things brilliantly and how to do things really badly. <laughs> yeah. Yours? Uh, yeah, just for me, less, so less significant to me, sort of world heritage question that's what more, more importantly about the sort of the, 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 you know, what we have in common between the two organisations and the two, the, the two uh, buildings is the people, you know, the geography. We, we have a similar story to tell in being at the heart of a community of people in a much sort of uh, uh, an interesting sort of historical, geographical, almost hub and spoke pattern. You know, like uh, Michael, you referred to Durham as the, the county part or county you know, city. Um, you know, Red Hills was the democratic part. The uh, cathedral was the spiritual part. You know, we, we, there's a huge amount in common, but it's, it's just about the centrality of Durham. I think within this, yeah. within the city, within the county, within the region. Yeah. Thank you. I draw that to a close, if I may. Yes. Just with a wee bit behind. You. Thank you both very much indeed. And best wishes. <laughs>
Have I? I'm going backwards, aren't I? Should just be able to press the space bar. The space bar, thank you. Um, so, World Heritage Sites that are designated by, by UNESCO, and where does UNESCO come from? It's, it's worth kind of remembering where, where, where the creation of that concept of UNESCO and the creation of the concept of World Heritage came from. So, UNESCO goals were created in 1946, so it's a direct reaction to the, the cataclysmic wars of the, of the mid 20th century. Um, so as well as the United Nations itself, um, it was seen that UNESCO was, ne was necessary to create a, a greater appreciation of our common humanity, to try and avoid these kind of things into the, in, in, into the future. So that's the purpose that it, that, that, that it was created for. And there's a lovely strap line on the, on the UNESCO website, which I'm going to try not to read out in its entirety. Um, but it is about common humanity, and understanding and sharing those kind of things. So that comes through the UNESCO goals from 1946, the creation of World Heritage as a concept, 1972, the convention, um, the UK's endorsement of that in 1984, and then the UK's first World Heritage sites from 1986, of which Durham is in that very first tranche, and, uh, and rightly so. So the, um, the, the, the convention, if you've ever had a chance to, to, to read through it, there, there is a lot of dense detail in there, but there is, there, there's some terrific, pithy, still incredibly valid um, statements about the value of heritage. And that one on the left there, again, not going to read it out, but um, that, those things to do with a source of life and inspiration. And I think that's, um, that comes through really strongly in the convention. It's about, it's, again, it's about people, uh, and, and the value of heritage to people, not necessarily just in and of itself. I think the world, to me, the world, the world heritage idea is a really exciting one. So um, we are part of a greater whole. Um, Durham, sitting here in the, in, in, in the northeast of England, is part of a, a, of a wider whole. I think it's a really interesting concept in the interesting times that have been referred to earlier. So. We're part, um, we, we are a World Heritage Site in our own right here, but we're part of an international community um, and, and that's supportive. And it's also saying that the, the value of Durham, the value of UK World Heritage Sites and responsibility for them is something that we, that we share um, with, the, with the rest of the world. Little aside, um, before, just before the World Heritage Convention was, was, was signed, one of, it, one of UNESCO's key heritage projects um, was the rescue of the Nile temples and the after the construction of the Aswan Dam. And I think this is a really interesting case about um, the sharing of expertise and the mobilization of resources from across the world to achieve um, something for heritage. But, and this is the really interesting thing to me at the moment, um, people replaced by those rising waters didn't receive the attention of the monuments and were pretty much disregarded through the process. And there's a really interesting article by um, William Carruthers in Apollo magazine recently, um, which I think was a really compelling analysis uh, of the need to make sure that people are, that are at the core of the World Heritage Convention as it's actually implemented, um, rather than it just being uh, seen about things. But there are more recent stuff um, on there. This is from the ICROM website, a page came across re recently. Um, the idea that World Heritage serves a purpose, it's not a, a thing in an, uh, just in and of itself, it's a really a purposeful thing um, and making sure it serves the needs of uh, the needs of people. So my second uh, contention um, is to do with outstanding universal value. That's the, the, the thing a World Heritage Site must have in order for it to be World Heritage, uh, OUV. And I think that that's at the absolute core of management, whether it's Durham um, or um, elsewhere. So for something like, uh, for a site like Durham, as a world heritage, we're not managing it for all the many other heritage and other values um, that are attached to the place and that are coincident with it. We're looking, trying to manage the outstanding universal value. And that's not saying that those other values are unimportant. Most of them are, are hugely important, important and co-located um, with the Durham World Heritage Site. But in world heritage terms, strict world heritage terms, we're looking at managing it's outstanding universal value. It has to be focused in that kind of way. Uh, 
outstanding universal value. That, that I, I just included this to um, so that I don't forget to say that it isn't just about the significance of the site. So that's the red pillar. Um, it's purposefully coloured to make it difficult to read from the back. <laughs> um, so it must meet the criteria. It, it, it has to have outstanding most universal value. It must meet the criteria. Um, so it's it, it's significance. It's UK heritage management terms. Um, but it must have authenticity and integrity, and you must have suitable protection and, uh, and management. And only if you've got all three of those uh, does it have outstanding universal value. Selection criteria, definitely not going to read all of these out. Um, so you need to meet one or preferably more than one of these to become a World Heritage um, Site. And I've um, purposefully high highlighted very subtly uh, number five because I think that's going to be ever more uh, a key focus for us over the next half century. So that interaction of humans with a changing environment in a time of irreversible change. Um, personally, I think nothing about the World Heritage Convention is more relevant um, to our current response to an issue like climate change. Um, <coughs> it's not necessarily suggesting that uh, it's going to produce amazing ways to, to address that issue, but it is um, showing the impact of such changes in the past um, and the even more pressing need to address them now. So I think it is, I think it's really relevant. Um, as I was leafing through this yesterday, I realised that this is this is already out of date. This is the list of, uh, of UK World Heritage Sites. I have missed off the inclusion of the Welsh Lake industry. And I, I have failed to delete uh, Liverpool, Liverpool's maritime <laughs> mercantile <laughs> city. Um, I, I love this li looking at this list and thinking, where are the gaps? Um, and to me, as an individual, I think um, we've got a, an underrepresentation in terms of where our country's perhaps made the greatest universal contribution and that's the sites of the Industrial Revolution and in science and technology. So really interested to hear about the, the Red Hill side of the side, side of things in that, in that regard. Um, again, slight aside, I came across this article from the Times recently, um, scandalously that there are 20 other things that should be on the World Heritage List but, but, but aren't. Um, I, I think this is about mis misunderstanding what, what um, uh, World Heritage is there for. It's not about saying something is if it's not on the list, it's unimportant or not beautiful or val valued um, or, or, or valid that people should love it, but that it must meet those sort of criteria to, to get the outstanding universal value. Um, and I think you know, Durham does that in spades uh, and the challenge is to make the most of that universality um, rather than dwell on the things that you feel necessarily should be on there that perhaps don't quite meet the uh, Make the criteria. Um, so, having said that about the uh, famous, the beautiful, and the awesome, which clearly Durham is as well, um, that le leads me to have a have a think about World Heritage Site status in Durham and why is it a World Heritage Site? I, you know, I normally think I know this kind of thing, but it's always worth going back and having a look and see if you do properly understand uh, uh, where significance lies. So, I've highlighted, I've taken the criteria again against which the the World Heritage Site in Durham was, uh, was designated and highlighted what I think are the key things there. So it's not that tricky. It's Norman architecture, it's Gothic architecture, and it's the relics of the saints. Um, so that's our first plank in, in, in understanding outstanding universe, <laughs> universal value of Durham as a World Heritage Site. As a World Heritage Site, not suggesting that, that there aren't hundreds of other values, incredibly important ones, that for Durham as a, as, a, as a city, that's why the site was designated. Again, I've tried underlining um, the, the, this is the uh, statement of outstanding universal value for, for Durham. I've tried to underline where, where, the, where the absolute um, key uh, aspects, I think, are. And it does have um, the, the, um, the beauty and the architecture and the relics. Uh, but it does have some other really, really interesting things to, to, to drill down upon. So that expression of political and spiritual power, and I think the, and the visual drama. So this is our first sort of reference to, I suppose, um, that, um, you know, the romantic beauty of, of Durham and it having, that having a, a value, a strong value within the, within the World Heritage type terms. So... It, but it is still really very specific about what we're managing the World Heritage Site for. 
who have gained lots of other values in Durham but, but, uh, and heritage values, but this is the outstanding <coughs> universal value. Um, and, in, and in World Heritage Centre, we're focused on those in terms of management. So aesthetics do get a look in there, that visual drama. But if we're talking about issues of development and change, um, and, if though, and if proposals don't harm those values that are on the screen there, then they aren't a World Heritage issue. So that's a you know interesting thing to find the logic in. Um, again, still really need to be clear. We're not saying that the, I'm not saying that there are other issues like townscape design, etc., are, aren't really important. And uh, but in general, they 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 may not be a strong world heritage issue. I think my final contention principles that I've tried to work with um, is that conservation and management of heritage is about positive management of change. Um, it's not, as I think one, one of the speakers, might have been Sue, said earlier, um, about pickling things in aspic. Um, there are very few heritage assets, I think, which need to remain exactly the same to protect their significance. The majority of them need to be sustainable. They hold hard fact of life. If they're going to be invested in, they need to be sustainable. Um, and the vast majority of heritage assets lie in living, working landscapes and townscapes. So they need to serve the needs of people and of wider society and that and that requires almost all in all cases uh, a gradual evolution of place it's not quite as simple as that though is it of course um the leading to it the national planning policy framework the 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 um, the bible no pun intended at, Dur at durham uh, for uh, planning decisions um pl places the protection of heritage and the more significant heritage, the higher the level of protection, right at its very core. But it does enshrine a planning balance. So the harm, harm to heritage must be balanced against public benefits. And if those benefits outweigh the harm, then proposals can be allowed to happen. Um, those benefits can include the big picture heritage issues. So things like sustainability of, of settlements that feeds into uh, the vitality, which um, justifies continued investment in place. Um, personally, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that, with that, and I think it's very far from a free-for-all that it's advocating, but it means that the impact on heritage, including our world heritage, is properly taken into account. The contrast then is then between the, the document on the right, the operational guidelines, which is UNESCO's Bible for how they feel that world heritage should be um, managed. Um, these are clear, and it's an absolute, uh, that world heritage should be protected from harm. All harm is, 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 what it, what is what they're saying. Um, and I think, as I say, I think there are contexts where that might be completely appropriate, but most sites simply aren't as simple as, uh, as that. They're living, working landscapes, cityscapes, townscapes, change and adaptation, perhaps more than ever, are necessary to make those places work um, and to work for the people who live and work in them. And I think Durham's a really important example of that. So we know there is a tension that exists then between the UK tradition of heritage management and UNESCO's. I'm going to say that I think um, if we can't find a, if we can't find a way through um, that tension, then we're not really serving the broad purposes of world heritage. If it's to build appreciation of our common humanity, the least we can do is find a way to coexist in terms of different traditions of heritage management. And I've got reasons to be optimistic about that we can bridge that. Um, uh, this is the recent ICOMOS guidance on heritage impact assessment, which I think is really helpful if a slightly weighty uh, tone to help guidance on assessment of impacts. And that likely focuses on the need to avoid harm wherever possible. Um, however, uh, perhaps it does mean in extremis, it does acknowledge situations where change and some harm is necessary. So I, I think there, are, um, th there is perhaps light at the end of the, of the tunnel. It's already been mentioned once today, the historic urban landscape initiative that UNESCO uh, have put forward um, well into its second decade now. Um, it does see historic cities as a, as a slightly separate cat category of heritage, places that need to change and adapt to, to serve the needs of the populace while preserving what's important to them. So um, always talking about these things um, better than um, driving ourselves into the, into the uh, the, uh, the, the wedge that's between us in terms of our conservation philosophy. 
So I think this is a really interesting point that we're doing. Um, managed change, I think, is a necessity for urban world heritage. Uh, change isn't always bad. Most of it's fine. Um, but it is a question about being really focused on where the significance of a world heritage site lies and being really truthful and ruthless when trying to come to a view about the level of impact that a proposal would have on, on, on significance, not more generally, but on significance. So um, picking, and I don't know if this is a controversial statement, but picking one of my favorite Durham buildings to emphasize um, this point, and appreciate there are a number of different viewpoints on Durham. <laughs> <laughs> I think this represents change uh, in one of the most sensitive landscapes in Europe. Um, and in my view, there is no harmful impact on the outstanding universal value of Durham as a World Heritage Site from this, this building. It doesn't interfere with your appreciation of architecture or the relics, and it doesn't detract from an ability to understand Durham's dramatic setting um, and uh, that display of really religious and secular power that Durham does so amazingly well. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but for me, it's extremely successful in integrating change in a World Heritage Site landscape without harm to outstanding universal value. Other views are available. <laughs> uh, so coming back to, 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 to people and some thoughts on the opportunities for Durham into the future. So I think, sorry if I sound like a stuck breaker, but the purposes of World Heritage are to build appreciation of our common humanity. It is an interesting time, but this is one of the, uh, uh, which is one of the tubes of glue that holds us together here in Durham and the wider World Heritage uh, community out there into the, into the UK and to the world that we're all a part of. Um, they must be relevant to people, both in terms of local needs and in playing their part in tackling wider societal issues. Um, so climate change, I think um, almost any heritage site uh, can take positive steps to play its part in tackling climate change almost everyone can do better. Um, I'm thinking about um, Durham particularly, open spaces and particularly the Wooded Gorge can be managed in a way to play a larger role in carbon capture uh, and, and, and tackling climate change more generally without harm to outstanding universal value. So it's a great, I think Durham is a great opportunity for those kind of things. Um, the nature of the city, I think the, you know, the green fingers that were, were talked about earlier, the wooding coming into the city itself makes it Durham ideally suits to a greater role in access and enjoyment of open spaces and well-being, the kind of things that um, lockdown and, and, uh, and the pandemic have really highlighted. Um, and then there's the nature of the World Heritage Site itself. Um, you know, one of the world's most amazing uh, religious buildings at its core to focus that activity that Craig talked about, the, um, the, the resurgence of an interest in pilgrimage, whether that's um, secular or, or religious in, in, in nature. And I think the university to me is an amazing opportunity. I know, again, we, we, there's, there's always a, you know, there, there's always a balance in the, the, these things. To have such a high percentage of the population uh, of, of, of the city of Durham being that unique university audience here for three years uh, in, the, in the main. And I think we do need to do more to explore um, with that audience what Durham as a world heritage site means to them or could mean to, to, to them. So um, those of you that have met me before, met me before, I am uncharacteristically very optimistic in interesting times for Durham. Um, I think in no small measure uh, down to the trust and its work, uh, feels to me that Durham is ideally placed to continue to protect its outstanding universal value while continuing to embrace the change and to evolve. That's the process that's given us the amazing townscape that we all love. Uh, but we can also see, I can also see Durham playing a, a leading role in delivering the kinds of societal goals and more relevance to people, which was envisioned by UNESCO in creating the whole uh, family of world heritage, which we are a part of. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Mike. That's the most positive and forward looking talk. Thank you very much indeed. Do we have questions? Uh, okay. One from uh, a Zoom attender. Um, 
question. Did um, Historic England or, or you personally respond uh, to the Times article about heritage sites? The, the, the one where it was the 20, yes, dis, 20 yes. disgraces, no. Um, uh, I think we probably just had to keep quiet <laughs> about that. There's a, there's, there's a risk, you know, um, and I'm probably as bad as anybody else at, at doing it, of, of patronising people about stuff, because it's kind of, you, you want to say, we're not saying that these, they, those things think they're less than we include Port Marion and a whole variety of really interesting things. They're not unimportant. Um, they're really valuable and they're really valued. And the fact that it might not be quite outstanding in the list of value is not to your detriment or, or, or some great um, you know, mark of failure. Um, it, it, but it is about understanding that it has to be, you know, it's, it's not the beautiful and the, per se, the beautiful and the um, uh, famous. It's about where our heritage has, uh, evidences a universal contribution to, to, to the globe. So um, that, that stuff about the, uh, the industrial history of our, our country and, and, and science it feels like you know, Red Hills. Um, that's the place where there's a big gap at the, at the moment. <coughs> Not every site is suitable to that, but we but we, we we could we could and should do more in terms of um, where we look to future nominations. Very personal view, not yeah. historic influence. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we sort of picked up on the airwaves that the British government is getting a little bit more shy, um, if not, uh, um, uh, yeah, a little bit more shy of applying for World Heritage Sites. Um, do you think that there is still the appetite uh, nationally to apply either for transnational surveys like the um, or other remaining sites with potential? I think there is. I mean, there, there, clearly it was a bit of a hammer blow when Liverpool was deleted from the list. And it's, it's by no means a simple issue to do that led, that led down that, that, that path. But there was, there was some perception that managing something like a, a living working city alongside UNESCO guidelines clearly posed challenges. But I think that I, I think I think there's still the appetite to not take that on, but but continue to dis discuss that. And after a gap of, of, of some years, the our parent department, PCLS, have, as you know, um, gone through the process of um, asking for nominations for the, the UK tentative list again, which is you know, not that long uh, not that long closed. And I, I just don't think that if there was no appetite to, to to take that issue on and for a wider discussion about where UK world heritage might go, they would, wouldn't have been asking and trying to build up people's hopes and expectations that we would be looking to nominate. Um, at the moment, I think the UK is still imagining nominating one a year, something like that. We made a commitment to that because um, Western Europe and North America particularly um, had the majority of world heritage sites and, and the rest of the globe um, uh, needed to, to, to have its numbers bolstered to form a more, a more representative thing. But, but I think the appetite is, is there, and I do hope that the appetite is there for the transnational stuff, because um, being part, having been previously been part of that through Hadrian's Wall, which mm. started off as its own world, and just like then <coughs> it so I hope it hasn't ended, um, is now uh, a world heritage site alongside the Antonine Wall in Scotland and the Upper Ration German Limes in Germany, that kind of, the, if, you, the, if the UNESCO purposes are gonna to continue to be relevant, the idea of working together across national boundaries <laughs> seems to be you know, yes. a really simple way of, of, of acknowledging that process. So I, I do hope the appetite's still there and I'm, I say, twice in one day, uncharacteristically optimistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I'd like to conclude on that optimistic note because we have someone waiting to join us for the final presentation via Zoom. I'll explain that in a moment. But first of all, can we thank <laughs> our I'm not exactly sure I'm in Matthew's hands here how this is going to work out.
that our next and final speaker is Chris Blanford, the president of World Heritage UK. Unfortunately, he contracted COVID and can't be with us, but I hope thanks to the magic of technology and the expertise of Matthew, he will, he will be able to join us and make his presentation. So Chris, I hope you're with us and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can I confirm, first of all, that you can hear me okay? Yes. Very good. Okay, Very good. well, th thanks to the technology. And <clears throat> secondly, thank you for the sympathy. I am on my way out of COVID, but not quite there yet. So I beg your um, forgiveness if I'm not my usual perky self. Uh, I picked it up in Switzerland while I was at a conference there a week ago, uh, dealing with the European Association of World Heritage Sites. Um, and I also just wanted to tell everybody that I have a particular fondness for Durham. I was a graduate in 1969, uh, so it always has a special place in my heart. And it was a great pleasure much later down the years that I was given the task of writing the first World Heritage Management Plan for the Durham World Heritage Site. Um, <clears throat> Yes, I have the privilege of being president of World Heritage UK, which sounds much grander than it really is, but it does allow me to have a quite substantial perspective nationally, which is what I want to share with you today. Um, and also to uh, point out to you how World Heritage UK works within the system. Um, I'll do my best to keep to the 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and not keep you from your lunch or your tours, but I hope you'll forgive me if I overrun. Happily, Mike has done some for me, so hopefully it can be a bit shorter. Next slide. Okay. Um, World Heritage UK is a NGO uh, which basically bridges the gap between government policy on World Heritage and representing each and each of the 33 sites around the UK individually, for which it acts as an advocate, uh, creates a good deal of networking and promotes learning and awareness of world heritage. Our vision, which you can see on the screen there, um, can be summarized as trying to get a more coherent and consistent national approach to world heritage planning and management. Uh, and uh, we are in a time of great change and challenge, as we'll see from the rest of the presentation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so Mike has done this little bit for me, um, but I do think it's worth emphasizing why we are promoting and believing in world heritage. It is that business of peace, which is particularly poignant now with Ukraine. Uh, and for all of us, and especially people of my generation, it is very much about making sure that these wonderful places are still wonderful for our grandchildren. I have one of four and a half years old, and I'll shortly be telling him about that next. Okay, so the World Heritage Collection, as I refer to it, um, has, with you as Durham as part of it, there are 33 uh, sites in the UK, 29 of those are on shore, four of those are in various wonderful places in the Atlantic and Pacific. Um, and if you take it as a whole, in addition to the story of our industrial heritage, and I'd have to say colonialism as well, as uh, Mike implied, um, they do as a whole represent a celebration of the island story. And we are lucky in that to have this number to be able to use that as a narrative. The question still arises as to how, whether we have already inscribed the best of the best um, and whether we keep on inscribing more or not. I'll leave you with that to think about. Um, let's just have a very quick look through the list visually. So next, please. So we have um, all kinds of different sites. Durham itself, we have cities. Uh, we have industrial heritage. Uh, I've got slate landscape on my list, as you can see, so I'm reasonably up to date. Next, please. We have parks. We have huge landscapes like the Lake District, as we call them, cultural landscapes. Lots of archaeology, Neolithic and otherwise. Um, and we have 
um, natural sites, not many, but natural sites such as the Giants Causeway, and most recently also we have scientific sites next. <clears throat> so if you put all these together, and they are essentially a, a, a collection which you could divide down the middle as being the icons, that is the well-known ones, the Hadrian site, Hadrian's Wall, Durham, Tower of London, Stonehenge, etc., uh, and the other sites which are less well known. But all of them have a great diversity um, and complex governance underlying them. It may surprise you to know that there are 500 different organizations uh, in, involved in the planning and management of World Heritage Sites. What I call the jigsaw is a great simplification of this, um, but I did want to point out to you that World Heritage UK, you can see it in the middle there in green or green blue, sits in the bridging position between DCMS in pink down that central column and the sites themselves uh, at, at the bottom. They are influenced and work with and collaborate with um, a huge variety of other NGOs, government departments, both international and national. Um, so uh, this arises really partly from the fact that World Heritage Sites have been evolving in terms of inscription in the UK over the last 35 years, and partly from the fact that obviously no size fits uh, no size fits all. Um, so next, please. If you take one step further uh, into the management of our World Heritage Sites across the country, <clears throat> we see that um, there is a range of different organizations that are responsible uh, for that management. Um, there are local authorities, there are public partnerships, there are central government agencies, and there are independent charities. So 76% of our World Heritage Sites depend on public funding, which is um, going to be difficult given the next few years. Only 23% only are anywhere near being self-funding, and, and all of those um, are, I, I would suggest to you, going to have some difficulty as well. I'm not going to try to describe uh, all of these in detail to you, but I just wanted to set the scene that it was an extremely diverse background to our wonderful sites. Next, please. <clears throat> But I think what is worth doing is just have a look at how some of this came about. It's been a 35 year journey for the UK uh, uh, and has gone from simple to complex. During the 80s and 90s, when the first sites, including Durham, were inscribed, um, it was pretty simple. Um, they were mainly the icons. They already had existing protection within uh, the legislation and uh, run by various agencies. There was very limited guidance as to how to nominate a site um, and how long it would take and how much it would cost. And it was very much run by um, ex heritage experts of one kind or another. As we moved into the 90s and the noughties, um, good practice both internationally and nationally began to emerge. You can see we were still inscribing 11 uh, World Heritage Sites during that period. They were also well supported. This is the time when there were regional development agencies uh, and funding was more available than it certainly is now. It was also a time when the townscapes and cultural landscapes were beginning to emerge. These so it was going on beyond the obvious icons uh, and partnerships were needed to be able to manage these and indeed to bring them uh, to the fore as World Heritage Sites. So, two, we also managed to achieve coordinators or local management at all of our sites, and the business of catching up on management plans uh, began in earnest. That's why I was involved in Durham early as a catch up for a management plan. And those management plans um, became the vehicle and visions for the steering groups, um, which uh, are now quite 
ubiquitous for all our World Heritage Sites. So we come pretty much <clears throat> from the noughties to the present, and the headline there is Challenging Protection and Management. Mike has referred to some of this. Uh, we have a reduced number of inscriptions now. Um, we have reducing public resources, 50% of what it used to be. And we have very demanding nomination requirements, which are is it makes it a costly process for a World Heritage Site to come forward. And of course, we see planning conflicts, which I will come back to uh, in a moment. Next, please. So what have we achieved there? <clears throat> As I said, no one site fits all, but we do have, unlike many other countries in Europe, I would have to say, coordinators and local managements, managers and management plans at all of our sites. We have, thanks to Historic England and others, have had and have regular capacity building programs uh, to help bring on the understanding of world heritage, all of those concepts that we've already mentioned, OUV, and what that means uh, to a wider audience. I would have to say, though, that awareness of world heritage is still very low. And we have um, stakeholder consultation, as it is in our planning process, very much integral to what is happening in world heritage sites. Other concepts, the cultural landscape, historic urban landscape concepts are now uh, very much to the fore. Uh, and the UK, as I understand it from Europe and elsewhere, is considered to produce some of the most in significantly good nomination documents and management plans uh, throughout the world, and they are looked to as exemplars. And the UK um, does participate internationally. As I said, I was in Switzerland last week and have represented through WH UK, um, uh, UK World Heritage Sites throughout Europe for several years now. Next. But the challenges remain. I just said to you that increased awareness in our World Heritage Sites is perhaps the biggest challenge still. That is the understanding of the obligations, and perhaps importantly, the benefits that World Heritage, World Heritage Sites bring uh, to local communities. It's getting there, but you would be amazed um, at how low that awareness is. I know that through the WHUK audit or review that we undertook in 2019, 2020. Um, and if anybody's interested, get in touch with me, I'll link you up to the report for that. But what that showed across the board, both in government departments, all the way down to local community levels, uh, there was a significant need for increased awareness. That's not the only problem. The others you can see there, so there is a skills gap still our local managers do their very best to engage with communities, um, provide information and knowledge about World Heritage Sites. Um, they are the heroines and hero heroes of the piece, very much so, but they are usually one single person, are quite often unempowered and usually have very, un uh, very limited budgets. I've already explained to you that the governance of each and every World Heritage Site is different. So that makes it quite difficult for policy to be uh, well established. It may well be that if leveling up continues, then we may see some light at the end of the tunnel to see legislation to underpin World Heritage Sites at the moment, which of course it does not. Funding models need to be looked at for self-sustaining sites. Um, and actually, uh, no disrespect to our um, colleague from uh, Visit Durham, but it has proved quite difficult to get other world heritage sites, perhaps it's different in Durham, to link in and integrate fully with the DMOs and uh, visitor destination people, both nationally uh, and locally. So, as I said, a coherent vision and more support from government, I think, is very much what's what's needed here. Next. So in 2020 and 2021, it was a bit of an up down year. It wasn't only COVID, but um, fortunately for the World Heritage Sector and the many people who work in it, they're quite used to um, needing to be resilient given that funding has been so low. One of the um, 
greatest benefits um, organized by World Heritage UK was the forum that it shared every two months with the World Heritage sector, coordinating, sharing and learning uh, what was going on, both in terms of the impact of COVID and what each of the sites were doing. It was a hugely unexpected benefit of the kind of communication between sites and around the sector that we know normally can't achieve because of the distance between uh, where everybody is. <clears throat> Um, I'll talk about Liverpool in a moment, but there were certainly some lessons to be learned there, and the same goes for Stonehenge. Uh, and as I've already said, we can remain hopeful despite the political shenanigans of the last few weeks, and it's good to see that the levelling uh, concept is still on the agenda, and let's just hope that that does have the planning benefits that were originally talked about. And on the plus side in um, the last year or two, we have added to our list of World Heritage Sites the Slate Landscape of North Wales, and as a serial site across Europe, the Great Spa Towns of Europe. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, so it's not for me to say everything about Liverpool. It would take the rest of the day. And um, but I just wanted to make a couple of comments. First of all, I'll hold my hand up. It was back in 93 and 94 when I was party to the drawing the lines of the original World Heritage Site, which as you can see, is made up of several parts within a buffer, buffer zone that took in much of the city center. There, there are um, many, many villains in this piece, and I'm not going to be the one who goes through that, but um, it is a tragedy that it was taken off the list. It is only the third one that's ever been taken off the World Heritage List um, and need not actually have happened. However, um, whilst it's a blow to UK's good practice in World Heritage, Liverpool will continue on and does have an incredibly good track record in heritage management. But how can we learn from that? We need to be very careful about defining boundaries that include derelict areas, because those derelict areas in today's terms are also the regeneration areas, and there will always be change. Um, that change can take place, but it needs to be done carefully. We need to acknowledge that cities are living, working places. Someone else has already said, not in aspect, quite right. And we, we need to respect, continue to respect the view of the community. Uh, Liverpool has a very vociferous community in many respects, um, and um, arguably they were not listened to fully during the process as the World Heritage Site uh, unwound. We also need to know that there is going to be a fair and consistent planning policy over time. Once again, it's been a constant changing policy in Liverpool rather than a constant one, sadly. Unusually, the original management plan Liverpool, for which I was responsible, did have a regeneration vision and plan in it, but it was not to be the one that the city followed. And perhaps the biggest question of all about Liverpool is why weren't those major developments scrutinised properly at a national level, and why wasn't there a planning inquiry? Anyway, there are many questions to be answered there. Next, please. Sitting on the brink a little at the moment is Stonehenge. Uh, will it or will it not go on the sites at risk as a result of the proposition of the tunnel uh, along the A303? You can see it in the middle of the slide there, the black dotted line. Um, it sits on the brink because um, the High Court have uh, said that government did not have the right to construct the tunnel. Um, but we listen hard to the politicians at the moment talking about building our way out of the forthcoming recession. I would just say to you that these things are often about polarized views, and this is certainly one example. That is conservation at one end and development at the other. No one wants to have World Heritage sites that are in aspic. In this particular case, the debate has become confused because if you look at the diagram there, you can see that the boundaries of the World Heritage Site are, are in part rectilinear. Rectilinear lines mean nothing on the ground. Landscape is a continuum, and that archaeological landscape uh, is as significant in some ways outside of those landscapes it is, as it is within. Therefore, to argue that the portals, the tunnel, should be outside of the World Heritage Site 
is not particularly helpful. Okay, so um, those are a couple of the current um, debates, or at least one long gone and another still to come. When the World Heritage Committee finally decides to meet again, we will see whether Stonehenge is considered at risk or not. Next, please. So what else have we got um, in mind for um, World Heritage? Well, Mike referred to the review of the 2011 tentative list. This is the short list, which is now currently underway um, in being assessed and will be announced in early in the new year, which will have a probably seven or eight sites from which the government may or may not choose one per year or one every other year to add to our list. We, we are hearing about planning reform. It is incredibly important that legislation to underpin the protection of World Heritage Sites is brought forward. It is archaic. That is not the case when our other national designations, such as national parks and other things, are all protected by legislation and have funding to go with. I believe that the World Heritage Sites collection, because there are so many of them, as outside places can continue to contribute to pandemic and tourism recovery. And I've, I'm sure and feel sure there is a dialogue to be had with Visit Britain and the local visit agencies uh, to make sure that these sites do actually do that. Durham is lucky in the sense that the icons of the castle and the um, cathedral are very much part of the tourism uh, attraction, as we've heard. That isn't always the case elsewhere. 50% of World Heritage Sites that are not icons and not so well known really struggle with this. For example, Derwent Valley Mills in Derbyshire. I would say this, wouldn't I? But World Heritage UK's recent report, the Asset for the Future Vision, which is, contains the stepping off point for a national strategy for World Heritage, is also poised, ready for implementation and I and others in WHUK spend quite a lot of time advocating uh, the use of this for government to give a much more coherent approach to world heritage. And finally, um, UNESCO is celebrating 50 years of the World Heritage Convention this year. Uh, I've been involved in a number of things around the UK in the last few months, um, being local celebrations uh, which are on the back of this. UNESCO themselves are asking the question, where are they going to go with World Heritage in the next 50 years? Have we already designated, at least in Europe and North America and in the West, um, the best of the best? Um, should we now stop? Will the underdeveloped countries be able to catch up? Uh, is it that in Europe, for example, sophistication of the nomination of World Heritage and management of World Heritage has reached its peak? Whereas in the underdeveloped countries, um, there is actually quite a lot to be done. I know, for example, in working in some of them, that it's much more about having the badge uh, than anything else, which is where perhaps we used to be, but we've moved on from that. So um, let us not be too pessimistic about it. Like Mike, I am actually quite optimistic. I see a sea change. I get to see the thing in the round and I get to see it internationally. So Durham, I think, is well set for the future. Um, I'm delighted to have been able to exp express my views to you. And as I've said, I have a great fondness for your city. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak. OK, thank you very much indeed, Chris. We, we really appreciate the fact that you've given you time to, to present the talk, even though you're not in the best of health at the moment. And we're very sorry not to have been able to welcome you in person. We have a little bit of time left, but not very much. Does anybody have any pressing questions for Chris? Patty? I'm just wondering um, uh, how to set this was to what extent has um, leaving the European Union affected um, the workings of organisations like the World um, Heritage 
<coughs> what effect has Brexit had on the way people manage organisations and funding? Could someone repeat that for me? It was a little difficult to hear online. What, what effect has uh, leaving the European Union had on managing uh, and collaborating on world heritage? Uh, two effects, one good, one bad. Bad that funding has been reduced markedly, <clears throat> which is quite serious. Um, but on the positive side, um, European colleagues who manage World Heritage Sites and who are all, who are in charge of them strategically are still very keen to engage with the UK. So actually, there is no impact in that sense. In fact, um, the engagement through the thing I was at, at at Switzerland last week or, or elsewhere continues to get better and better. Um, and I think um, also, I sense that the agencies in London, uh, Historic England and others, and, and actually some of the NGOs, such as the National Trust, all are keen to link in with European colleagues so that there can be more uh, shared work, shared ideas uh, between World Heritage Sites. That's the message I came away from uh, Zurich with last week. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, that brings our morning to a conclusion. Chris, thank you very much indeed for your contribution. The programme does say the chairman can have a few brief concluding remarks, and I will be brief, but they're important because they're practical for the most part. First of all, I'd like to thank all our speakers and to all of you for being so patient, sitting through the whole morning like that. Most of you even managed without going to the loo, which is quite <laughs> I want to give particular thanks to Matthew for all his yeah. IT help, and of course to, to Jane at the back, without whose influence and enthusiasm this event wouldn't have happened. So thank you both in particular very much. With break for lunch now, the event will continue. We did have a schedule of starting tours at two o'clock, but I think if we could put it back to quarter past two. No, Adrian? Not so the castle is fixed, is it? Right. So uh, those of you who wish to, to go on the castle tour with Adrian there, uh, it will start at two o'clock. And you need to gather at the castle gates over in that corner <coughs> of Paris Green. Um, so we'll, we'll stick to two o'clock. Um, Martin Roberts will lead a riverbanks walk. And those of you who wish to go on the riverbanks walk, just wait outside the Pemberton rooms where we are now. And Jane herself has offered a tour of Palace Green and some more explanation of the way in which the whole World Heritage Site operates. So uh, Jane will, will also, I think, wait outside here at the, the entrance to the Pemberton Room. So um, the, the other thing that's, that's on offer is the exhibition in the Durham Museum, the old uh, St. Mary Le Beau Church, just down Dunkow Lane and behind me here, just trying to get myself the right way around, um, just down at the bottom here. Uh, that will be open from pretty well straight after this, this event now until about maybe four o'clock this afternoon. And there's a special exhibition in there that Adrian and his colleagues have put on to, to mark the 80 years work of the City of Durham Trust. And uh, it is a very, very interesting exhibition. And indeed, it's, it's in a very interesting museum. I don't know whether there are many of you, well, I know there aren't many of you here who aren't members of the Trust, but if you've been inspired to become a member of the Trust, please see me afterwards, as they say, and uh, I'll do the business with you. Also, at the back, Barbara has some publications from the Trust which are for sale. You, you, very welcome to have a look at those. And one final uh, bit of 
uh, advertising. There's been a couple of references to Cook Hall being taken over by the National Trust. The importance of green corridors for the city. And the next Trust talk will be on Tuesday, the 6th of December at seven o'clock in Elbert Riverside. And it will be given by the people who are now looking after Cook Hall on behalf of the National Trust and who are going to talk about their vision for Cook Hall as a sort of gateway to the green corridors around the city. Tim is here who edits our bulletin. That will be advertised in the bulletin, which will go out to members in a week or two's time. Is that about right, Tim? Yeah, in a week or two's time. So that's the 6th of December advance notice. So thank you all very, very much indeed for, for being here, for your contributions. Hope you found it a worthwhile and enjoyable morning and that you'll enjoy the afternoon as well. Thank you very much indeed.